All right, good evening. I'd like to call to order the Lakewood City Council meeting on October 23rd, 2023 at 7 p.m. For those uh, wishing to join via telephone this evening, the number is 720-707-2699. And we have the same uh, webinar ID as the number for calling in, which is gonna be 870-1796-0123. You'll press pound, pound to enter the meeting. With that, will the clerk please call the roll? Paul. Here. Olver. Here. Mia Carrera. Here. Stewart. Here. Franks. Here. Strom. Here. Jansen. Here. Charzai. Here. Springsteen. Here. Vincent. Here. Councilor Abel is absent. Mayor Paul, you have a quorum. Great. All right, I'd like to welcome everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight. And for those people, those folks that are joining us online, a couple housekeeping notes. Um, we, all, we are all here because we care about our community. Certainly love the passion. So I just want to make sure that if you do have a sign, you're welcome to that. Try not to block your neighbor's views. And uh, we're also going to make sure that we have a civil discussion this evening and uh, refrain from audible support or discourse with the speakers. <laughs> we have a budget hearing first, so there'll be a public comment portion just for that budget hearing. That's our annu annual adoption. And then we have regular, uh, regular public comment. So if you are able, please join me and rise in the Pledge of Allegiance and we'll remain standing for a moment of silent prayer. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. Please be seated. All right, Councillor Springsteen, your light is on. I wanted to make a motion to put public comment back where it should be at the beginning of the meeting. This is very unusual that it would be put sixth on the agenda. Second. Okay, so we have a motion and a second, and, and just to uh, reiterate, when we do budget hearings, we sometimes start early. We had our 6.30 LRA meeting, which was prior to this, and then we go right into our second part of our budget, which is what you're seeing here. So that has been our uh, operations in the past, and so there is a motion and a second uh, to move public comment um, back to where it is, but I will reemphasize that there will still be public comment and public comment on our budget. So please cast your votes. Okay. And that fails uh, three to seven. The nays being Paul, Maya Guerrero, Stewart, Franks, Strom, Sharazai, and Vincent. Okay, item four is our statement of conflict of interest. All members of the city council have the responsibility to comply with the terms of charter 7.2B and excuse themselves from voting on any matter in which they determine they have a personal, financial, or business interest. The City Council is empowered by Charter 7.2b to agree by unanimous vote, excluding the member at issue to excuse any member of the Council from voting on a matter in which they determine such member has a personal, financial, or business interest. Councillor Olver. Yes, I, I just had a question for you, Mayor. Are you going to be voting tonight? Because, yes, sir. Because you have a clear conflict of interest okay. because of your employment by the city, full-time employment by the city of Denver. And I don't believe that you can f serve two masters at once. And in my, in my field, oil and gas exploration, I was in it for 40 years, very professional um, business. When somebody quits, or not, let me back up. When somebody gets another job, they go in, they tell their bosses they have another job, and what happens is they are shown the door, basically, with full benefits and everything else because they actually are now much more prone to vote for, um, support the other business. And I think that you have the exact same problem because, not because you're working for the city of Denver, but because of what your position is inside the city of Denver. Because you are on the executive council, right? Or executive, 
You're on an executive something or other. What is it? I, I work for the Regional Affairs Department. Right, but you're on the, the mayor's executive Certainly, committee. Certainly, no, and, and I understand, and in, in fact, we have an ethics code, and I certainly, as, as every member, has the uh, ability and the, what would the word be, the responsibility to call out any kind of conflicts, and so we actually have gone through this for the last couple of weeks to make sure there are no conflicts, and certainly if you see something in this budget that is conflicting with my role in Denver, I would ask you to state that, but we are very clear about perceived and real conflicts and have run all the flags through legal on both sides to, uh, to ensure that. So if you do see something under 7.2B that you would like to state, I'd ha be happy to address that conflict. Okay, I appreciate that. I would say that it would have been nice if you had disclosed your employment by another city ahead of time instead of having me bring it up. I mean, it, it's kind of common knowledge, but it's not common knowledge that you've been working there full time for Thank six you, weeks. And Thank so, you. I appreciate um, that. Yeah. So, and, and I don't blame you for getting a good job at all. Yeah. <laughs> I well, would have, I would have gone too. I, and I, I would have. I think it's important to state I, the, the mayor position in the city of Lakewood by charter is a part-time position. And um, most people do work outside and it's, as we were running these flags, there are other communities where there's elected officials that work and serve on board. So, but I appreciate right. the, the information. And with that, I'll go ahead and ask if we could turn that off if possible. Thank you. And uh, I'll go ahead and open uh, the public hearing on ordinance 2023-41 and ask the clerk to please read that in. Item five, second reading public hearing for ordinance 0-2023-41, adopting a revised budget for the year 2023 for the city of Lakewood, Colorado, and further adopting the annual budget for the city for the fiscal year beginning on the first day of January 2024 and ending on January 31st, 2024, estimating the amount of money necessary to be raised by levying taxes for the year 2023 to defray co the costs of municipal government of the city of Lakewood, Colorado for the fiscal year beginning January 1, 2024 and ending January, excuse me, December 31st, 2024, and estimating the amount of money to be derived from other revenue sources, setting forth the appropriations for each fund. Thank you. All right, with that, um, We've, this is our second hearing on the proposed budget. And just as a precursor, the Lakewood Reinvestment Authority had their budget hearing prior at 6.30, and that budget was passed. Um, Ms. Bjorklund and Mr. O'Neill are here for questions as the presentation has been shown twice or presented twice, and it is online. Ms. Bjorklund, do you have, please? All right, thank you. Good evening. So as um, Mayor Paul indicated, I presented the budget twice already, and this evening I'm going to do something a little different. Um, as there's been uh, some questions that have come up during the budget process, and I thought it would be helpful to um, go in more depth on two items that have come up, uh, Charter 12.12, .12, um, and the reason for going through that one is it is a complex area and answering questions through written questions and answers, you don't really get the depth that you need to have an understanding of um, how, what the background is and um, uh, the full picture of what's happening. So I wanted to give you all the opportunity of um, having more information about 12.12 .12 and the city's perspective, um, as well as answer any questions that you have. The second item that I wanted to cover is the examples that were requested in the last meeting for uh, the mill levy reduction and what that impact is on property tax. So I thought I would cover 12.12 uh, .12 and the additional information that wasn't asked during the budget process, um, and then uh, give the opportunity to ask any questions that you may have. So um, at a summary level, 12.12 .12 in the city charter 
is um, a limitation on property tax and it is um, a limitation of 7% on um, growth year over year. The way the city has interpreted this historically is that it is a limit on the number of mills, um, so the mill levy rate. Um, however, Councilor Jensen has brought up an alternative um, interpretation of it, which is that uh, revenue is actually the measurement for um, increasing uh, uh, the limit on the 7%. The discussion that I want to have this, this evening is not um, actually the language within 12.12 .12 because I do not think it's actually relevant any longer. Um, and the reason for that is subsequent to the passing of Tabor in 1992, the city no longer um, took any action on 12.12 .12 and followed uh, the Tabor requirements and has followed the TAIL requirements since 1992. So the fact that we, the city has been following TABOR since 1992, um, it supersedes 12.12. .12. And the reason that uh, the city made that decision in 1992 is one, because TABOR is more um, restrictive than 12.12 .12 is, and also that um, uh, Tabor, since it is a state law, if there's any conflict with the charter, the state law would um, supersede the 12.12. Uh, .12. So um, I uh, thought that it would be helpful to show how Tabor is more restrictive and also where there is a potential conflict with 12.12 .12 in the information we have. Um, today is, of course, numbers. I always like to prove things out through numbers. Um, so in front of you, you have, uh, I'm gonna just walk through the columns very quickly. We have the year, and I started in 2005 because that is the year our previous financial system went back to. We don't have um, any information beyond that in a financial system. Property tax revenue um, is the second column. The percentage increase in revenue is the third, and then over 7% um, property tax growth is the next, Tabor refund is the next one, and the Tabor refund mechanism, and then mill levy. So what I'd like to talk about is the Tabor refund um, as to what that impact has been within the city um, first. So you can see in 2008, 2010, and 2013 that the Tabor calculation indicated that the city did need to refund money to uh, the taxpayer. And the mechanism that was used is uh, to reduce the fees for stormwater. Um, after 2013, 2014, 15, and 16, there was um, a much larger amount that needed to be returned. So uh, the mechanism that was used at that time was property tax instead of stormwater. And the reason there's that color coding on the um, slide is because when you use property tax, it is a two year um, difference when it's identified to when it's actually returned. And the reason for that is, let's take the example of 2014. So 2014, it was identified that $5.2 million needed to be returned. That was identified in 2015 when we had our audit. So that was halfway through 15. 15 mills were already identified. So it had to be adjusted in 2016. So you can see that 5.2 and that yellow color and then on the row 16, 2016, you have the 9.2 highlighted. So what happens is in 2014, the money that the city could not keep is taken out of the revenue and put aside so that we cannot use it. And then it's put back into the revenue in 2016 when the mills are reduced. So you can see on the right-hand side that the mills are um, much less, it went from 
2015 to 2.031 in 2016. You would expect that the revenue would go down as well, right? Because the mills have gone down. However, because we took that money out, we're putting it back in, then it um, reconciles the, the revenue. So over uh, that time period, um, we had a reduction of 5.2, 4.5, and 5.8. And in total, uh, the city since 2005 has returned $17.1 million. So if you still have a concern about 12.12, .12, even though it's indicated that we are following Tabor now, if you wanna look at the column that shows the over 7%, the first year that it's showing if we were still following 12.12, .12, that it would be $900,000 that needed to be returned. The city returned $5.8 million. So it exceeds the amount that would have been required by 12.12. .12. And then in 2018, the 2D was passed in which uh, the voters uh, determined that the city could keep the funds above the Tabor limit in order to do specific projects, uh, which we've discussed, um, specific areas that can be invested in. Um, since this, the voters decided that, uh, the city did not do refunds in the years 17 through 22 and will not do them through 2025. But if you look on the right-hand side of this slide, you can see how much was moved um, from the general fund to the uh, Tabor fund. So the calculation was still done for Tabor and it was identified how much was above the limit and was put into that fund. If 2D had not been approved, those funds would have been returned to the taxpayer. So um, this is where conflict comes into um, place between Tabor and the charter. Because from the charter's perspective, it would, if you're interpreting it as a revenue increase, then we should have been returning 0.8 in 2018, 0.6 in uh, 2020, and 0.3 in 2022. But because the voters said that they wanted us to invest the funds in um, projects, specific projects that were identified, um, the city did not take that action to reduce the funds. They moved it to the Tabor Fund. So since Tabor is a state um, law, that, that was what was followed versus the 12.12 uh, .12 in the charter. So that's a lot of information. <laughs> um, and if you're still concerned about 12.12, .12, the city has returned $17.1 million in Tabor and it's only 2.6 million, which would have been the over the overage amount, which has been fully covered by that 17.1. So that's a lot of information and um, I'm available to answer questions. So thank you. That was a nice way to talk about some complicated things that I think this council has been seeing information going back and forth on. Do you want to go to your next piece? Do you want to finish your presentation? We can go back or what? I thought it'd be best to answer the questions on this first okay. and then go to you um, betcha. the mill. Okay. All right, council. So we'll go to questions on this subject. Did you want me to sit down or stay here? Whatever you feel comfortable doing. <laughs> the, the, yeah, there's no light, there's no lights on, so I don't think there's any questions on 12.12 .12 at this point. Nope. So if you'd no like question. to move into your next okay. phase, thank you.
As you can see, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> Somebody say there's 18 pages? Is that accurate? A lot of work went into that. And just for the audience's sake, so what she's pulling up right now through the budget process when council is asked questions, those are all memorialized and then sent back out with updates to council as they're answered. And as a reminder, are these also on Lakewood Speaks? Yes, these are also on Lakewood Speaks. Thank you. Um, so I just want to first identify that th this is a replacement of the previous examples that were given. Um, we made a couple of updates in the data, so you shouldn't be comparing the two. It's that these are new. So what was asked for and what we've done is we uh, took three examples of um, homeowners at the and their value of their home is at $400,000, $600,000, and $800,000. Um, and the $400,000 over to in the middle, um, uh, it's showing the comparison of what would be the taxpayer's benefit if when um, when you make the change. So what is in the proposed budget right now is 4.711 mills and the taxpayer at a $400,000 home. And please keep in mind that every individual is different because their taxes are different. So this is just an example. It's not based on any particular person. Um, they would be paying $127 to the city if you reduce it to 4.28 mills, they'd be paying $116 to the city. So the benefit compared to the proposed budget is $12. Um, and then all of them work the same way. Uh, if you go to 600,000, 800,000. To the right hand side, uh, then you see the comparison of 4.71 mills to 3.85 mills. Um, and what the benefit would be to the taxpayer. And then the second part of the question was, what's the impact to the city if you make this change? So um, <clears throat> we based it, the comparison on a 2023 budget for uh, that is $13.1 million in terms of their property tax revenue. And then the 2024 proposed budget, which has $14.5 million in there currently. So on the left-hand side, it's just, it's identifying how much that revenue would be based on each of the mills. Um, so 16 million for what's there now, and then, um, 4.28 mills for uh, is uh, 14.5 million and then 3.85 mills for 13 million. So this is the net assessed value from the assessor's office. And then the change in revenue from 2023 um, is uh, we would have an increase of $2.9 million um, at what we are in the budget right now so um, increasing because of the increase in the assessment rates is 2.9. And then if we were at 4.28 mils, it'd be 1.4 million, 3.85 mils, it would be basically flat. And then the change in revenue from what we have in our proposed budget, the first one is an increase of 1.4, wait, yes an increase of 1.4 because we estimated it at 14.5. And so now this would be the assessed value. Um, and then 4.28 mils would be flat. And then a reduction at 3.85 mils is $1.5 million. Does that make sense? Okay. That's it. <laughs> All right. Nicely done. Thank you for those two presentations. So again, this is ordinance 2023-41. I'll open public comment on the proposed budget before us. If you have not had a chance to sign up for the budget, we'll get through this list. 
and then if you mm, signed up for the budget but didn't mean to sign up for the budget and wanted to talk at general public comment, just let me know and we'll switch you back over. So, Ms. Gies, budget? Okay. And then Laura Lee? Yes. Okay. You are up. And I'll just remind folks that it's a three minute time limit. Your uh, timer up here, you'll see that, and it'll go uh, yellow with 30 seconds left and then red at the end. For those folks who are calling in online, when you're at 30 seconds, you'll hear. And when your time is up, you'll hear a, I'll try to politely wrap you up. Also at three minutes. And um, again, just want to make sure we keep the decorum of chambers. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. Um, this is the first time I've attended a meeting in person. So welcome. it's a historic moment for me. <laughs> um, so my thoughts in regard to the mill levy. Um, so it's my understanding that we currently have a surplus. Um, it doesn't make sense to me to increase the mill levy to create more of a surplus. It feels like it's lacking integrity to take more money than we need. Um, and because your positions are a position of public trust, I would hope that you would do the thing that would show integrity. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right, Ms. Sinks. And after Ms. Sinks, I have, and forgive me, Tina on uh, Iowa. I'm also reserving my time for now. Oh, okay, great. <coughs> Thank you. My name is Glenda Sinks, and I'm with in Ward One. Um, I'd like to ask the council to vote against the mill levy reduction. Um, we heard at first reading that it was a very symbolic gesture. I don't know what the proponents uh, want to symbolize, I can only guess. And we also saw previously that, wow, things really tanked during the pandemic. Things can just go down very fast. And I think um, our personal finances are probably, you know, um, something that we live by. So in other words, during windfalls, I don't run out and throw my money away. <laughs> I like to save it and invest in, in projects. And so I think that the symbolism is that um, for me, I, I don't want to have a bare bones budget. I love that the city was able to spend the money on the land at 20th and Quail, we had that money there. I, I know too that the infrastructure can be failing and crumbling. We need money for that as well. Just like we all save money for projects that we want at our house, I would like to see that happen as well. And again, that word symbolic, it's very symbolic because it's not of substance to individuals necessarily, 150 I saw up there. Um, but it's not symbolic. It comes to millions of dollars when we're talking about the city and uh, about budget cuts. And, and so what's going to be cut in the budget? I, I haven't heard that. Is it some jobs that would be eliminated or some resources for the police? So um, for individuals, it's not symbolic. And so once again, I would say, let's keep the budget and the mill levy where we are. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Ms. Nickerson. Good evening. And then Mr. Dorman, you're up next. Uh, my name is Jody Nick. You can hear me. My name is Jody Nickerson. I've done this at the Capitol, but never here. I love this. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm in Ward 2, and I just briefly want to say that I lost my husband recently, and I live here in the Lakewood area, and I'd like to stay in my home, um, being that 
widows that you don't have a big surplus of, you don't know when your husband or spouse passes away, that you may not have a lot to live on, but I love to stay in my home. And I think the reduction in the mill levy, I don't care if it's $50, we all got a little bit back this this month or this week in our uh, mail, $98. It means a lot to people like myself to be able to stay home, do something uh, that I might need to do at my house. I do feel that the budget is very ample, it sounds like, and I need to educate myself more with Late Good. I'm going to get more involved with you. This you have a lot of ample funds. And it's not reducing what you're taking away from certain people or jobs or police or anything like that. But I do feel that getting a little bit back makes people want to stay here and know that you are working and looking out for the citizens and community, no matter how big or small. If I have anything left, I'd like to give it to Natalie. Thank you. Mr. Dorman. Come on down. And then I have um, Margo Cullen. Mar 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 yes. Okay, great. Good evening. Good evening to you all. First of all, to all of you on the city council, thank you for what you do and your service to the city. You field all those phone calls from people whose neighbor's dog is barking and the potholes don't suit them, and you take all those calls, you suffer the slings and arrows, and you do it on our behalf, and I am grateful, uh, even though we are about to disagree. <laughs> all of us have uh, noticed a couple of phenomenon in our financial lives over the past, past few years. We've seen inflation where our money buys less. It's a strain on our pocketbooks. On the plus side, we've seen the value of our homes go up. That's plus. But the value increase in our homes is a paper gain. It's not a monetary gain. And if we allow government to capitalize on that gain with not really any additional service, we have to pay for it out of our pockets. We've got less cash on the hurt side from the inflation. So I'm asking you to support Councillor Jansen's uh, proposal to give us a small relief. It's not a decrease. It's a decrease only in the rate of increase. And it's something that uh, I think the city can live with, and certainly the citizens can live with it easier than they can an increase. And thank you. Thank you. Marge, and then Fred Clifford, and then James Mace. Good evening. Good evening. So I wanted to talk about something personal to me. I'm a retiree. I have a disability income. I have a reverse mortgage. My house originally was $400,000 that my husband bought so that I could use it with a wheelchair. Okay, clear? It went up to 600000 This last time it went up to a million. That's $400,000 increase. My yearly taxes for the house are $4,000. With the increase being almost double what it was before, it's going to go up to $8,000. I only bring in $30,000 a year. At $8,000, you're talking about a third of my income being for my house in order to keep it, just keep it. So I would definitely like you all to reduce it. I know taxes are hard. I know that I'm struggling. Everything is going up. It's gone up so high that I have to go now and get food. And I don't even qualify for SNAP by about a, a couple of hundred dollars. This is what all of us are facing. And I expect you all to help us out. And I reserve the rest of my time to Natalie. Great. Thank you. All right, Mr. Clifford. Good evening. Good evening, Council. Um, I was coming here once before, I don't remember what year it was, and I was just thinking about that as I was driving in, and there was news trucks here. 
don't know if you remember, some of you will remember that. And why the news trucks were here, we were getting rid of the uh, grocery tax. And the reason why they're here, it was unprecedented. Normally, governments raise taxes. We were, we were lowering taxes at that point. And like this, it wasn't very much per person, but every little bit helps. And I think, uh, pardon if I, um, if I butcher the paraphrasing, um, I've been kind of busy lately, so I didn't look it up. But Lincoln said he wanted a government that's for the people of, I'm sorry, of the people, by the people, and for the people. Well, that particular night, it was for the people because we reduced the burden. And I think we should do that here. And as everybody knows here, I knock on a lot of doors. I've actually been hearing this at the door before bringing it up. People are telling us, hey, we need a mill levy decrease. Um, it's not the most common thing so far. The most common thing is people are afraid of the threat of high density in their neighborhood. But th this, this comes up quite a bit. And one person says, if we don't re reduce the mill levy, um, they're robbing us blind. So, you know, I don't know if that's the most accurate description, but that's the way people feel. They're, they're getting hosed. So thank you for your time. Great. Thank you. Mr. Mace, on the budget, sir. And then before I go to pool time, is there anybody else in chambers on the budget? Okay. All right. Ms. Kentner, you'll be after Mr. Mace. Good evening. Good evening. Mayor Council, I have two questions for you about the budget. How much money is Lakewood actually spending to get re to replace the um, um, walk signals for Alameda and um, Quail compared to and uh, Sixth Avenue. Um, I would like to know how much money Lakewood is spending to replace the buttons and the walk signal itself. The other question that I have is how much money are, is Lakewood also spending to fix the AD buttons for the bathrooms um, and for chambers as well? I'd like to know that. And with the mill levy, how much of our tax dollars is going into that compared to how much you guys are actually spending? Thank you. Great. Thank you. Ms. Kentner. Thank you. My name is Kathy Kentner and I live in Lakewood. And I've been talking to a lot of people lately and this is something that has come up. And we can budget and have a successful city and a successful budget and lower the mill levy. It is very meaningful to a lot of people, particularly people who have lived in Lakewood a long time and seniors and those on fixed income. Whatever relief we can offer them at this time, we should. And if we can, and we can. Thank you for passing Mary Jansen's motion. Great. Thank you. All right, Ms. Menton, we'll go ahead and do your pooling of 10 minutes and then we'll go online. Ms. Peters, your hand is up, and if anybody else is online and wishes to comment under this budget topic, go ahead and press star nine. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I will hand this in once I'm all done. We already have it. Oh, well, then I have more to add. <laughs> yeah, there's we quite can a few, add so. Ramey Johnson, Leonard Megachetti, Wendy Purcell, 
Um, I don't know if you had Jim Kinney. Mm -hmm. I think you did, and Linda and Tina. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, great. Then I will be starting here. So I'm Natalie Menton, and I reside in Ward 5. <clears throat> this is really about separate issues, and I think they've been muddied just a little bit, so let's try to clear that up. We have one thing, which is the fact that in Colorado we have a property tax problem because especially there are a lot of people that are house rich and not their income does not keep up with that house wealth. And has been illustrated here that is part of housing affordability, property taxes. And if we look at some other states, it can get downright scary where property taxes can go. That itself is one issue that we have to address. And Proposition HH that's being presented on the ballot is not the answer. It doesn't provide local property tax cap like it promises. It's optional. It's actually referred to as a soft cap. And where property taxes are collected is at this local level. That's where the decision is made and where the local community decides what is appropriate. And a matter of fact, Prop HH says it has a property tax cap, but it excludes two large taxing agencies, that being school districts and home rule jurisdictions like Lakewood. So the cap doesn't even apply. And for the others, it's just optional. So our solution comes down to a room like this. Lakewood right now, based upon what the assessor has stated, is looking between, if you want to figure the calculations and me being generous, conservative in that manner, between a 24, over 24% 24 increase to a 29% increase in revenue from property taxes that would transfer from the citizens to the city. And it is a windfall, it's a bonus. And incomes have not kept up with that. So there is no reason that the government should be profiting by double-digit gains at the pain and at the expense of the citizens, the taxpayers. That is one issue to address in itself. How do we make sure less harm is created to the people, the property owners, and really the renters, because it's passed on, and to consumers? because King Super's bigger property tax bill gets passed on in the cost of higher eggs and more costly bread. So everybody pays for this. So how do we prevent that January 2024 pain? It's by making sure the city is able to take in a moderate level and not the windfall at the expense of citizens. But then there's a second issue here. And this is where it gets more complex. And that's about the discussion about Charter Section 12.12, which has a property tax limit in it. And I've been studying property tax um, matters here over the last several months since this has really come to a head and actually done quite a bit of research and work to figure out what are these property tax protections that taxpayers have. Well, it starts with one most people know about Tabor in the Taxpayer's Bill of Rights, which doesn't have a specific property tax cap, so to speak, but a revenue across the board. It allows government to grow a moderate, appropriate amount so that the citizenry can support it, make it sustainable. That is part of our state constitution. Then, besides that, we also have another protection in Colorado for property taxes. It's called the annual levy law, and a lot of people do not know about it, but it limits property tax increases to 5.5%. Now, this law was put in place in 1913, 110 years before Tabor, 110 years before it, this annual levy law, property limit. The problem is, in 1913, they really weren't thinking about home rule jurisdictions. So it doesn't cover them. It doesn't cover us if we're in a home rule. So what's the filler on that? Well, the filler is Charter 12.12. .12. The problem we're running into is the interpretation. And let's read it. 
the city council shall not levy an ad valorem tax that just means property tax the city shall not levy a tax on taxable property in the city that provides revenue from such levy in an amount greater than was levied in the preceding year plus seven percent now that is saying based upon first of all I read it and many others including some legal professionals who are not strangers to municipal and tax law they read it as the trigger there is the revenue can't go more than 7%. So think of 12.12 .12 as the filler. We don't have the annual levy law limit, okay? And this makes sure that at the Lakewood level we have that protection from these big spikes. Well, what city staff's response has been, first of all, they are interpreting not as a revenue increase 7% over year to year, but increasing the mill rate. Nobody I've encountered outside of this, and I've talked to lawyers, and interprets it that way. One lawyer quoted as saying, whoever read it that way contorted it, contorted it by definition, twisted. Doesn't make sense. So we have this problem of the interpretation, but then staff was asked about Lakewood 2D, which waived our revenue limits here in Lakewood. They were asked in the budget not a questions. Question number 54 where supposedly voters waive their right to this city charter. How does an ordinance, by the way, override our city charter? And 54 said, did Lakewood ballot issue 2D amend our city charter 12.12 .12, property tax limitations? And the city staff responded back, no, it didn't. Charter 12.12 and Tabor are two different issues. Ballot issue 2D had to do with Tabor. The voters passing 2D in 2018 gave the city the authority to keep revenue collected above the Tabor calculation. So how did the voters waive their property tax limit with 2D? That was the first it was really heard of tonight. So there's multiple problems here. We have one, just forget about the city charter and all that stuff. We, the city, without amending this budget, which was approved by staff, the mill, approved by staff put forward, approved by the budget and audit committee, was recommending a 29, and let's say even a 24 or 25% increase to the city coffers at the pain of taxpayers. That's just a problem in itself. But then secondly, we have an interpretation problem with Charter 1212, and the courts have not reviewed this. And that's, let's just say, very possible. We have an interpretation problem. And then based upon that with the answer that uh, a city ordinance cannot override our city charter. So if we didn't have a Tabor in place, then we had 12-12 we had, uh, in place. We had the protection in place. We were not warned that anybody was waiving it. So first it's been heard. They already answered the question. It should have overridden it. Then we have a problem where the city has over collected revenue over years. And therefore, a 3.85 mil reduction as proposed by Mary, Councilor, uh, Councilor Mary Jansen is entirely appropriate at the percentage level and that should be even lower because what it appears like is the city has over collected property taxes at least over the last few years. And thank you. I am now leaving a minute 24. And thank you all so much to the citizens. I hope I spoke in a way that reflects what you hoped in that the city of Lakewood should be providing property tax relief and just reducing it to 3.85 is generous in itself. Um, should be lower. Great, thank you. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, one last thing. I wanna address the dollars. All right, so we're, um, not, we're not gonna, we're okay. not gonna do it. I wanna get this in real quick. <laughs> There's been talk about corporations getting a break. Well, mill levy reduction is, is all equal. It's across the board, you pay in more, you get a break, you pay less, you get a break, it's relative to what you paid in. That's the way it should be. So, but the fact of the matter is in Lakewood right now, we're allowing Walmart at Colfax and Wadsworth to keep property tax revenue because of a decision made. So I hope, I'm glad to know that that will end in August, 2024. And that's one more thing is we have more money going that's going to a mega corp right now. And we'll come back to these coffers 
or it should be, and the citizens deserve a break. 50 bucks buys more groceries or whatever the person needs, but it's money in their pocket. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we're, that's, that's going to be it. So get it out. And then we also have a TV set up outside if we want to continue. So just want to make sure that we are respectful. We're all here because we care about our community. I want to make sure we keep that decorum. So bear with me. Let's make it That's happen. That's a First Thanks. Amendment form of expression. So, so Councilor, you don't have the floor. Um, all right, Ms. Peters, you are online. And if you want to come on over and if you give us I, I, your, I, what ward are you in for the record? Um, thank you, Mayor Paul. Uh, my name is Patty Peters, and I am in Ward 5. And one, I'm sorry, one second real quick. Let's get your time going. All right, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, and I'll be super quick. Um, as I stated when I was there two weeks ago, um, um, I lead by truth, um, and I would simply like to make sure that all uh, Lake, City of Lakewood property taxes are collected per charter. Uh, secondly, um, I just really hope that, that there is not a city council that was elected to represent, represent the people that looks at any mill le levy reduction as a ceremonial gesture. As uh, one of the other speakers pointed out, sources of revenue changed. We used to have a grocery tax, things changed, now we don't. As Natalie pointed out, uh, we had been giving a tax discount to Walmart. That ends in August. It's a different source of revenue. Additionally, in 2023, the city of Lakewood uh, started um, having permit fees and will receive taxes from uh, short-term rentals. So sources of taxes change, and we have a lot of hurting people in our community. I heard that loud and clear tonight. Um, and I hope the people that have been elected to represent all of us um, hear that and can make sound uh, fiscal decisions that are best for all of us. Great, thank you. All right, anybody else online, go ahead and press uh, star nine. All right, we'll close public comment. Appreciate all the comments. Um, so council, we have two things before us, certainly questions. So I wanna go through the questions and then uh, separately we can go through and make uh, motions. So I'll hold off on asking for a motion until we get through questions. Councilor Jansen. So I guess we kind of already went through one of the questions I was going to ask you about 12.12. Um, um, and I'm just worried. I just beg to differ myself, um, the way I read it and the language that um, we pulled uh, comes to the same conclusion that it's revenue based. Um, I, I don't understand how we could do the mill levy by seven, seven percent. It doesn't make any sense to me. So um, I'm just kind of really, that's one of the questions I, I had on that. Um, I, m most of mine are comments, so I think I'll save my comments. Thanks. Okay. Questions? Okay. Seeing no questions, I'll ask for a motion. the adoption of ordinance 0-2023-41 on second and final reading second all right we have a motion a second and now so for further discussion or amendments since that has been motioned and seconded 
Councillor Jansen. Thank you. Um, so I make a motion to set the 2003 2000, excuse me, 2023 mill levy rate at 3.85 percent. Is there a second? Did I say second. Oh, oh, excuse oh, hold me. Hold on real quick. Do you want to clarify? Leah, let me clarify that. I make a motion to set the 2024 oh. mill levy rate at 3.85. Second. And I have some opening statements. Just one, one second. We have a motion and a second. Mr. Rob, you clear on that? Okay, we're good on that. Yeah. Uh, if I may, please. In order to avoid any sort of issues with ta with Tabor, in the event that the meal levy reduction wants to be, or that you as a body or future bodies decide they want to increase the meal levy back to four point seven one, it should be phrased as a temporary meal levy reduction. What was your intention? My intention is to set the. 2024 mill levy rate at 3.85 percent it's not temporary so hold on real quick so you want to reduce it in perpetuity you can always raise it if you need to so with the not people's no. vote so let me just get clarity from our city attorney sure if it's reduced without it being termed as a temporary reduction, any subsequent move to raise it would have to be to, by a vote of the people. Right. All right. All right. We're okay. Glad we got that straight. So please bear with me. All right. So that's where you want it to be? Yes, please. Okay. So there's a motion and a second uh, as stated. I have some opening statements. All right. Go ahead. So my opening statements for why we need to reduce our mill levy to 3.85%, whereas Lakewood's total taxable property value has increased 24.3% or higher for the year 2023, as reported by the county assessor on August 25th, 2023. And whereas a 24% increase in taxable values results in higher property taxes and bears undue financial harm to residents, businesses, and consumers for property tax bills payable 2024. And whereas Lakewood City Charter requires a 2024 budget to be adopted by the first day of November. And whereas in Lakewood City Council has the statutory duty to certify the ad valorem property tax levy to the Jefferson County Commissioners no later than December 15th each year. And whereas 2023 proposed ballot issue proposition HH does not include a property tax cap for the city of Lakewood or other home rule jurisdictions. And whereas property taxes are a factor in housing affordability and such tax assessments should be determined, calculated to produce lower taxes to improve housing affordability and financial stability and whereas the city of Lakewood has retained nearly $38 million in taxpayers' bill of rights, Tabor rebates, due to a temporary waiver from revenue limits for years 2017 to 2022, which includes an additional 7 million in addition to this initial 22 budget, 2022 budget, and those overcollected taxes would otherwise have been refunded to taxpayers. And whereas prior to the temporary Tabor rebate forfeiture, the overcollected taxes were refunded by the reducing the property tax levy in years 2015 to 2017 and reduced fees to owners in prior years. And whereas the city of Lakewood's ability to, ability to withhold Tabor rebates from taxpayers extends through December 31st, 2025. And whereas the city of Lakewood did not reduce the mill levy during the years from 2019 to 2022, resulting in a property tax revenue increases for the city during that period of about 24%, about 8% in case per year. Private sector, sector salary increases were limited to four or 5% a year, creating an undue burden on property taxpayers and whereas the economic development agreement with Creekside Shopping Center, Walmart, terminates 8-9-2024, will result in increased revenue to the city 
And whereas city sales tax amounts collected increase automatically in conjunction, conjunction with recent ongoing inflating costs of goods and services, creating increased amounts of tax revenue for the city, while compounding the burden on the sales taxpayer by paying both more for the products and services and simultaneously paying more sales taxes due to the rising prices on the goods and taxable services. And whereas the Lakewood City Charter 12.12 states that the City Council shall not levy an ad valorem tax on taxable property in an amount greater than was levied in the preceding year plus 7%, with exceptions and in prior years, we have exceeded 7% without any apparent adjustment. And so I have this, I already had these questions and I, I just have um, some following, a closing statement, but I'll, I'll digress and for more discussion. So our motion, or uh, discussion on the motion, Councilor Sharazai. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I appreciate the conversation and I would just recognize and I there was a, a person who made public comment and it's a great reminder that the city of Lakewood doesn't collect grocery tax and when you look on um, page 59 of the budget book we have one of the lowest sales tax rates so I think that there's a number of ways that we've showcased to the community a desire to be helpful in this and I believe it was Councillor Olver who said that the our last budget hearing that this was a symbolic uh, gesture. And, and for me, you know, a $23 savings is hard to um, get behind. It's not cash in your pockets. It's the savings on your tax bill annually. When we have people who are slipping through the cracks and need services in our community. And so I would be open to a one-year reduction. But the way that this motion is phrased, uh, this is in perpetuity. and. You know, being on city council and having inherited some of the decisions of a past city council and what they've done, I don't want to put ourselves in a position where we have to consider that in the future. And so I would be open to considering a one year reduction. But I think the way that it's phrased in perpetuity is, is not uh, something I can get behind. Thank you. Councillor Vincent. Um, the previous councillor said a lot of what I was going to say. Um, I do not know how we move forward on this. I also represent the ward that has the biggest discrepancy and the most people that are hurting and the lowest income. So I would like to do anything to help them, but they also have the highest percentage of renters with the least amount of parkland, the least amount of sidewalks. And it's what I get queried on in question probably at least twice a month on this. Why don't we have the same things as wards? Blah, blah, blah. And they, they go through. Um, so I, I personally do not like something. The grocery tax is very equitable to me. I get the same discount that anybody else gets. Um, and I too, I was gonna bring this up and I don't know how we go through. I would be very open to a one year uh, reduction, but I don't know if I offer that as a friendly amendment, then if that's not accepted, then we vote on that and then we can bring up another one as a one year. So somebody needs to help me on that. So I'll just ask for clarity. Without a friendly motion, can a motion be made upon a, an amendment, an amendment to an amendment? Yes. Okay. What, what did I just do? <laughs> okay. okay. I, is it appropriate to do sure. it now or do we need more? Okay. I move to amend to a one-year temporary um, reduction in property tax mill levy. Okay. Second. So there's a motion and a second on the amendment. So I have initial lights on for people that want to speak, speak to the First Amendment. Um, I guess if you want to speak to either the first or the second, because they are pretty close to each other, we'll go ahead and keep going down the line. So just a reminder before us right now is an amendment to amend <laughs> the original. <laughs> the difference is temporary. Councilor Olver. All right, thanks. Um, I wanted to start with the temporary word you, you suggested putting in there. Um, 
I, I've lived through the 80s. I came here, I moved to Lakewood in 1980. And I've seen the downturns. I've seen two condos, two be one bedroom condos going for $50,000. And I've seen other things. So I know the economy goes up, it goes down. Our pr housing prices go up. Our housing prices could easily go down. So uh, uh, what actually do you mean by temporary? I know what temporary means, but, but how would it work in, in uh, Councilor Jansen's amendment? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, because, I mean, just saying temporary doesn't mean it expires in a year, two years, 10 years, 20 years. But is that less just, if we say temporary, does that mean that this council could then push it back up, the mill levy back up in 10 years if suddenly it was necessary? You've actually brought up a very good question. Which is how it depends on. I do it once in a while. Got a little wood on the ball. Uh, but it's, it's how it's phrased. It can be phrased as a temporary one year reduction or a, just a temporary reduction. Now, the, dip, the reason that that has a legal um, application is that if it's not phrased as a temporary reduction, then there may be taper implications to any subsequent increase. If it's phrased as a temporary reduction, then there is no taper application for an action by council for a subsequent increase back to the 4.71. So it really depends on how the phrasing works. And it's always difficult in these situations because we're going off of sort of amendments to amendments. And there's, there's sort of no way around it, but there's amendments to amendments as we're doing it, sort of building the plan as we're applying it. But does that at least answer your question, Council Member Over? I think so. Um, I mean, really what it comes but, but to by putting like, temporary doesn't mean it's automatically going off, going away anytime soon. It could last for 100 years, in fact. It depends on the phrasing. If it's phrased as temporary and for one year, then it ends after a year. If it's phrased just merely as, sorry, thank you, Jim. If it's phrased just merely as temporary, it goes on in perpetuity until there's a change. Until there's a change by council, and it probably right. will not, unless state law changes, won't have to be a vote by everybody. Yes. Okay. I would, um, Councillor Jansen, would I would actually like to change the, as the second, I would actually like to change your motion to put that word temporary in there. Is that so, right? And just real quick, real quick, let me process that. Cause no, 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 you're fine. You're fine. So would we then, if, if that is amenable here, we'd have to pull, we already have, so we have a different one on the floor right now. Mm -hmm. Well, can I just, can I just take her friendly amendment? And so go for the temporary so hers amendment? wasn't friendly. Hers was, oh. yeah. But um, I think okay. if, if can I start if, over? Yeah, if yeah. if our second and our second maker wants to take those off, Councillor Stewart. I can withdraw my second. Councillor Vincent. I remove my amendment. Councillor Olver. Yes, I review remove add, your second add the temporary. Yes. Okay. Yes, so I removed back my to second. the original I motion maker. my motion. There you go. And I'd like to make a new motion. Please. I'd like to make a motion to set the 2023 mill levy rate at 3.85. 24, excuse me. Uh, 3.85 um, as a temporary one year. No, wait, I'm not. No, as temporary. You second. don't need to say, so, you don't need hold to on, say hold one on. year. Hold on, just hold on. Just, so, I'm thinking just temporary. Could you just, could you stop there? Dead stop. Okay. Could you pull back your second, please? I pull Thank back you. my second. All right. If you want to just restate the motion, please. Okay. I'd like to make a motion to set the 2024 mill levy rate at 3.85 as a temporary. Second. Okay. So we have a motion and a second on a second go round. Um, I'll Do just I keep still have the floor? Because I didn't continue. Let me go back to, we addressed your question on the temporary, which got us to a new point. So let me just keep going and go to Councillor Franks, who hasn't had the floor yet, and then I'll circle back around. Councillor Franks. Well, I had a different question, um, but I do want to circle back and make sure I understand what 
temporary means in a practical sense. I'm going to be off count. This is my last official meeting. So I want to make sure I understand and we can project out to those that are joining on council in, in a few weeks, what does temporary specifically mean? So if we put this in place, then what happens for the next tax year to 2025? In 2025, a new council could make whatever decision it wants on the mill levy between 4.71 down to zero. In the same way we're doing it on this budget yes. night. Okay, so just wanted to be clear on that. Um, is it still questions or is it more? Just pertaining to the particular motion, please. Okay, well, it is pertaining to the motion, but I, but I do want to say that certainly I appreciate everyone's uh, comments. We did hear from a lot of folks who um, are in support. We also heard from folks, many of the same folks who voted for the Tabor timeout, that they are interested in investment in the community. And so uh, all those things need to be taken into account. Um, and so I'll be doing that as we listen to the rest of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Councillor Jansen and Councillor Olver. Okay. Um, I guess I'm a little confused on this 2023 mill levy and the 2024. I think it needs to be the 2023 mill levy. That's what I'm putting this on because that will affect everything that's happening for this coming spring, right? When the new. So, Ms. Bjorklund, please. <clears throat> You're setting the mill for 2024. 2023's mill's already been set. It was set in 2022. Okay, sorry for my confusion. That's okay. Sorry. Councilor Oler. Okay, um, let's see. We're talking about only the temporary reduction. We're talking about the reduction, okay? And I'm so much behind this. Um, this time, uh, we. We talked uh, previously on some of the other meetings, and I was I was thinking talking about the average in Lakewood is a 30% increase in your t in your property taxes, and that by the way um, Lakewood gets most of its money from sales tax, so we don't actually Lakewood does not get a big chunk of your property tax. Well, totally, uh, the schools get a lot, the county gets a lot, state gets a lot. We get a very small share. And so, but this time, I actually found my, uh, what is it, yeah. my valuation. Yeah. Mine went up 39%. So, quite a bit, and uh, any little bit counts, but I still, like, I guess I've said that it's symbolic. And it, I, it really is, because it's still, I can afford that, even though I live on Social Security. And Social Security went up, as you probably, all the Social Security represent. 3.2% is what I heard. 3.7, less than 4%. Um, and so 39% on my taxes on my house, which is the biggest bill I have every year. Um, and I'm going to get 3.2 or 7% more out of Medicare. So it isn't going to be long before I'm hurting. Um, and and kind of start getting pushed out of my house, just like some other people around here. And so just doing this little bit, yeah, it's a bit symbolic because it's not a lot of money. But you've got the school districts, which are closing 19 elementary, or has closed 19 elementary schools. So they're actually losing students. Do we really need to give them a 30% increase in revenue? No. And so, and the same thing with the state, and the same thing with the county. So if Lakewood does it, lowers the mill levy, then you have the other governmental entities like the county, the state, the school district, everything, who might follow suit. There already are a couple I know around, around the state who have done the same thing. And so hopefully this turns into a snowball effect and hopefully we actually will see some relief by the time the bills come to us next summer, no, next spring. Yeah. And so that's why I'm totally for this. And even if it isn't a lot of money, and I would like, there's some misconceptions about it. It's, people talk about it's only going to affect homeowners. Well, of course not. Anybody that rents, it's going to affect them. There's not a landlord in this state or the whole country who isn't going to pass along a giant tax increase along to the renters. So every renter is going to see a giant, you know, 
maybe a 39%, well, not a 39%, but a big, you know, a big jump in their rent. It's going to happen, and hopefully we can stop that from happening. Same thing with the real, uh, the stores. Like uh, we've talked about Walmart a couple of times. Walmart also will be, you know, paying a lot, and they'll be, you know, but they do the same thing. They pass their tax increases along to into the price of the things you buy. And so it's it's just all flowing downhill. <laughs> and so that's that's the main reason. Um, and I, between the 39% going up and the 3% increase, you know, I'm not going to be able to go out and buy nice jackets like this thing, which... <laughs> which I got in an estate sale for four bucks. <laughs> so, so I'd really like, you know, I'd really like to pass this amendment. Thanks a lot. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Any other comments on the amendment? Councilor Jansen. I just, I just wanna, I have a closing statement. As I fully understand the magnitude of this issue, um, I'm asking for a listing of the property taxes we've collected going far back as possible. <laughs> Staff provided these figures and she did show them to you back to 2005. And the calculations included year over year whether we had increased or decreased. Several years show us exceeding 7%. 2016 we collected 18.29% over the year prior. 2018 we collected 15.84% over the year prior. 2020, we collected 12.90% over the year prior. In 2022, we collected 9.88% over the year prior. So it looks to me like we've been over collecting a substantial amount of money. So when I propose this mill levy reduction, it, it includes many factors and those who are listed in my comments earlier. Property taxes affect renters, property owners, consumers. A mill rate reduction is fair tax relief. It makes up the upcoming bill less and everyone gets a reduction that is directly related to how much they have to pay in January 2024. The city has benefited from inflation with higher sales tax collections. It's completely inexcusable to let government profit from double digit gains at the expense and pain of the taxpayers. I hope council will support this motion. Thank you. Right. Councilor Matt Guerrero. So sorry to um, ruin the moment, Councillor Jansen. I didn't mean to go after you um, <laughs> because it was a very good closing statement. Um, I, I just, before we vote, wanted to make clear that I um, am very likely to vote no on this, but would, if we come back at the mill levy, vote yes on a reduction to 4.28 mills, which basically would allow us to break even with our assessed budget. Um, I too represent Ward 2 and I, I do really recognize the importance of keeping money in people's pockets. I also know that representing a part of the city that has been historically underserved and given um, less attention than was maybe always needed when we are finally in a place where we are getting some park investments, really serious sidewalk investments, and things that my community have been asking for, not just of me for the last couple of years, but really for years and years of the city, and we're finally to that place. I feel deep concern about reducing what our current proposed budget is um, without really knowing exactly where that's going to actually come from. Is that going to come from my community's bike lanes? Is it going to come from the city's crosswalks, so I would be very open to the reduction that would put us at a breaking even of a four point, a reduction to 4.28, which is in the charts on the question packet on page 17, which is also on Lakewood Speaks for those who are trying to follow along. So just as a reminder, reducing our mill to 3.85 would reduce our, um, from our current proposed budget to, by 1.5 million, but reducing to 4.28 would um, essentially let us be flat. Um, I also do really want to point out that there is um, not good evidence that the cost of food, goods, or even rent is actually reflective of local tax rates. And I want to point out specifically that we know that 
uh, grocery companies such, a, such as Kroger have had larger profits this year than there have ever been before, while the cost of regular people has skyrocketed. And I, too, am deeply impacted by that inflation. But a reduction of the mill at this level is not actually going to have any bearing on the cost of your eggs. It just won't. That is, that is absolutely not how this works. And so, I, like I said, I would be very in favor of the reduction where we end up at a flat rate um, so that we can pay for all the services we're currently promising in our budget. Um, but if we reduce below uh, that amount, I am not comfortable with voting in favor of this. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Councilor Springsteen. I'm in support of Councilor Jansen's uh, uh, amendment. Uh, one of the things I think she's saying is that we've essentially, the old adage, had taxation without representation, and she's trying to uh, right that wrong. Um, and nobody ever talks about the efficiency side of the budget. So what if we're not losing services, but we figure out how to be more efficient in our expenditures? One example might be inflated salaries in the city. Um, but, you know, some of what I'm hearing up here from the very, very wealthy counselors sitting up here on the dais is that what we've been told by people here today who are saying $50 in their pocket means a whole lot to them is an insignificant amount of money to them. And I would say that we need to listen to those people. It may be a minimal amount of money to people up here, but it means a very great deal to the people who are speaking to us. So yet again, let's please listen to the citizens and what they're directly. These are slam dunks, you know? These are slam dunks to vote for this stuff for the people. But somehow, there's always this constant resistance to doing something good for the people. I also just wanted to mention <clears throat> Somebody mentioned to this about our last meeting. Um, I could barely see Councillor Jansen. She's in the dark over here. So I'm just wondering why some of us are in the dark. Because there's, there's an ADA request to deal with it. Thank okay. you. Well, I, I didn't know about an ADA request. Yep. So there's an ADA request and we will accommodate. Okay. Councillor Franks. Thanks, Mayor Paul. Well, I certainly, again, appreciate all the discussion um, uh, to speak to uh, Councillor Mayotte Guerrero's point. I would definitely, uh, based on, you know, all the constituent feedback, including those that want to, uh, you know, leverage those dollars for investing in the community, I would be in support of the revenue neutral 4.28. Um, mills, and so I would like to offer a, uh, a motion to uh, set the mill in a temporary basis for 2024 to 4.28. Second. Second. Okay, who is the second? Councilor. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilor Franks and a second by Councilor Mayak Guerrero. Okay, Councillor Jansen to the amended amended motion. It's so um, we have a problem with that because it's not going to the 12.12 charter. Um, we have a charter that we are not having the correct, it's not have, had a judgment. There's not been a legal anything on this. Um, so we don't know. Um, and I'm just worried you're gonna put that, how, how are you gonna refund all this money if you find out that that's not following the charter. Okay, so there's a motion and a second. There's no more lights on. This is the amendment to do the revenue neutral option. Well, point of order on this. We, we actually have two amendments. One is one number, one is the other number. It's not a amendment to an amendment. It's, there's two separate numbers. Um, Correct, but the amendment, there was an amendment made that was seconded based upon the earlier amendment, but I will refer to our legal. I think it's 
think I understand that the amendment that was offered by Councilmember Franks was to amend the initial amendment of Councilmember Jansen. So, oh, I apologize. Thank you. Uh, as I understand it, the amendment from Councilmember Franks was put forth to amend the amendment put forth by Councilmember Jansen. So what Councilmember Franks' amendment is to change the number to 4.28. That amendment could either pass or fail. If it fails, we'd still have the 3.85 sitting there. If it passes, then there would be a vote on whether or not to amend, to amend the existing budget at the 4.28 mill levy rate. Great. All right. Thank you. Ma'am, you're out of order. So there's a motion and a second. And there's no other lights on. Please cast your votes on the secondary amendment. And that amendment passes seven ayes, three nays, the nays being Olver, Jansen, and Springsteen. Okay, so we're back to the original budget with one amendment. Are there other questions or amendments? Okay, seeing none, there'll be an amendment motion to pass the budget as amended. Yeah. That's what just passed. No, I, just, I, I believe yeah, that no, the Please, yeah, that's, that's great. No, that's cool. So the original amendment set forth by council. So that's still on the floor. Was amended now to be 4.28 and that's the one on the floor. So the vote now there needs to be a vote as to whether or not to pass the amendment at 4.28. All right. Now, real, real quick, but, but that would be, Mr. Dortag, just to make sure, though. So historically, that passed as an amendment, right? right? That was an amendment to the amendment. Right. That passed. The next would either be other amendments that come along or we move to adopt 2023-41 as amended. As amended, okay. So, so I think, yeah, if we're doing it as amended, right? Then we then historically that's, that's what we've done. Page. So because yes. there could be other amendments, so whatever else passes, then that would go in that bucket of as amended. I, yes, I, you I just think voted we're still on, on it. the same page, and I just you just there was a motion the in a second, that and that was that was what just passed. What just passed. From my understanding, what just yep. passed was an, an amendment to the amendment, so the amendment itself has not passed. So the 4.28 amendment has not passed. It it's just been amended from 3.85 to 4.28. The actual amendment itself has not passed. So, Mayor, if I may, so the amendment was just to change the number, but Councillor Jansen's okay. was Thanks to do clarity. that for a, you know, to say that it was temporary, and so that's what now needs to okay. go in Thank order you. for the change to be a temporary, correct? That's all right. It seems clunky, but I appreciate it. So, all right. Well, and I have, I have a question. Yep. One second. Let me just, we're going to get some clarification. All right. So your original amendment was amended now back to the four point, the revenue neutral option. So Councillor Jansen, then Councillor Olver. Thank you. So um, I'm sorry, the 4.28 is not neutral. It's not neutral. Um, I can show you right here. Um, the city's going to be bringing in another $1.5 million, over $1.5 million. It's an 11.76% increase. So I'll go to Councillor Olbert. Ms. Bjorklund, do you want to show that slide that shows the difference between these two? Is that okay? Councillor Olbert. Yeah, I have to agree with Councillor Jansen on that one. We're over the 7% limit of, of uh, our charter, which is, by the way, we're talk, we've been talking about 12.12 .12 all night long. There's a section of the charter that some, I and other people interpret to mean we can't spend more than 7% more. We can't collect more than 7% more than we did last year. Um, and other people have a different opinion on that, and they say that we can collect more than 
the 3.85 would put us at 7%, the 4.2 something would put us over that 7%. And so my point there is that we will now get into a range where we're open to lawsuits uh, from activists, lawyers, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, I'm still going to vote for it because it still actually is a help, but it's going to pass. Um, <laughs> sometimes you know these things. Uh, but, uh, by the way, and I do have a point at this time about, like you mentioned, this is the third budget meeting, but we brought this up previously, and, and it's like a moving target as to why the city can collect more than 7%. Last time around, it was like, well, we're interpreting 12.12 .12 to mean that we can take more. This time around, it's like, well, because of Tabor, 12.12 .12 doesn't matter anymore. That's not a good way to, to convince people uh, of, of your point. Uh, and so I'm sticking to my, my guns on, on um, that we really should stay to 7%. We're increasing our revenue here. I mean, we're going from whatever it is up to seven, and now, now probably eleven, is it? 11. So yeah, so we're we're not cutting services, we're not doing anything less, because we're increasing revenue by seven percent, even at the lowest level. And now we're looking like, to me, we're going to open ourselves to lawsuits. Yeah. Councilor um, Franks, that's about it. Um, thanks, Mayor Paul. I did, did want to just clarify, and I don't know, I think it would be helpful to bring back up the slide. Uh, what was being referenced was the, the bottom box on 2024 proposed budget um, in the uh, basically showing that the change in revenue would be you know, would be would be flat. And uh, again, just want to really make sure to speak to the public. I mean, obviously, this is a very uh, important issue for a lot of folks. People do feel very differently about this. I think this uh, number strikes the right balance between those who w are very concerned. Um, we've had a lot of requests from uh, the public. They want uh, the city to buy more parkland. They want additional amenities. They want additional recreation services. Um, there's also a very large backlog on our sidewalks, lots of areas where we have children walking, who there's no continuous sidewalks. We have bike lanes. We have a lot of things going on. So I think this strikes the right balance. And I did, again, just wanted to thank you for bringing that up. I I just wanted to reference that just so it was clear what I was referencing and I think Councillor Mayotte Guerrero was referencing as well um, but thank you okay so we have a motion and a second to the amended motion there's no more lights please cast your votes that passes nine I one nay the nay being Councillor Jansen okay so back to the original budget. Hmm. Uh, not quite comments. I think if there's any other motions at this point that people want to make, and then we can go into comments or if they're tied together. Councilor Jansen. So I'd like to have a second, uh, another motion. Um, I would like to s the staff to add language in the title that we are certifying the mill levy with this agenda item number five. This was brought up at the last meeting. The title doesn't say mill levy right now. So for clarity, we did address that. What, Ms. Bjorklund, do you want to? Mr. Rob. Uh, sure. Thanks, Mayor. Um, we did like a six-year review of budget ordinances, and that title seems to be pretty standard. The, it is reflected in the ordinance itself that the mill levy is adopted. Why can't we have it on the title? Um, it was on the title before. I, yep, we can amend the title. I'd love to have I'd love to have an amendment on the title. Okay. That includes mill levy. Okay. Thank no you. No problem. Second. second. Okay. Motion is second. And do you have more clarity on the list? So you're taking just the subject and where do you want to see that put? 
So here, hold on, let me get the agenda. I'd just like to see it where it says and mill levy. So we're actually, people know that we're talking about the mill levy and not, you know, that we have to adjust the mill levy. Um, so where it says revised budget, mill levy and 2024 budget. Okay, so ordinance 2023-41 adopting a revised budget and setting the mill levy, no, adopting a revised budget for the year 2023 for the city of Lakewood. And I guess we would go down to December 31st, 2024 and setting the mill levy. Is that where you would probably put it? I just want to make sure before. So it would read adopting a revised budget for the year 2023 for the city of Lakewood, Colorado, and further adopting the annual budget for the city of Lakewood for the fiscal year beginning on the first day of January 2024 and ending on December 31st, 2024, as well as setting the mill levy for the year 2024. Is that okay? I mean, yeah. okay. Do you want to, is that okay with you? That yeah, language? sometimes as long as it's the people know that we're setting the mill, okay. maybe they know what that is. So there's a motion a second on that amended on the title. Please cast your votes. <laughs> Councilor Matt Guerrero, are you, okay, thank you. Passes 10 ayes, zero nays. All right, Councillor Olver. Okay. okay. <laughs> I have a motion. Um, I would like to remove something from the budget. Um, you, uh, it's on, uh, I can't even read it. Page 14 of the uh, capital project detail sheet. It's the Lakewood sign to be put up. Oh, uh, okay, so the light rail bridge over top of 6th Avenue. There is a $800,000 expenditure in the budget to put a big Lakewood sign printed out in big letters and, and very well lighted. Um, I think that's a waste. <laughs> and uh, 800000 yeah. 800000 for a sign in the middle of Lakewood that says this is Lakewood just strikes me as like really government waste. And so I move to uh, remove that from the budget. Okay, there's a motion and a second. I said, is there a second? Sorry. Second. Okay. And just for clarity's sake on that, if you remember when the light rail came through, that was a signature bridge project with RTD that was lit up had beautiful lights on it and it was a signature bridge. This doesn't have anything to do with putting Lakewood's name on it, but it's been a continued conversation with many residents from a lot of different areas to try to work with RTD on finding a solution to have those lights on what they deem their signature bridge be reinstalled. And so there is money set aside. It's not necessarily all of it. And we're trying to explore how best to do this. It is unfortunate because RTD was the um, group that put that up there and they were supposed to last forever and they didn't but it's based on feedback and continued conversations from council members in wards one uh, as well as other communities about that so it's not just to put up a sign that says welcome to lakewood just to clarify no, actually it is i mean the picture in the budget shows this the bridge I understand. and a giant but Lakewood. That, that right was there. from a, a branding study that was done for the city of Lakewood years ago. That so was a piece of that for their signage. Is the is it also not eight hundred thousand dollars? No, the number is accurate as to what will be set aside to explore what is going on with R T D. And we may not all right. Okay, we're not we're not gonna do it. I, I promise you. <laughs> so this is that's where this conversation came from and those facts do matter and you may disagree with that and that's fine you made your motion and there's a second but just know that there's a lot there's a lot deeper conversation that's happened with rtd about that so motion in a second please cast your votes huh? 
to remove it. Yes, the motion is to remove that page 14 from the budget. So I, I my light was on. Did it oh, not show? Sorry. There you are, Councillor Franks. So there's been, you know, over the years, a lot of, uh, you know, communication about this. So what I'm trying to understand is that um, there are a lot in the community ward for, I mean, obviously it's a gateway to get to our community. When the lights went out, it was certainly something where there was a source of pride when, it, when they were on and when they were not on. What happens if we again a pass this budget again and it determines that there is a way in which we can work to get um you know other funding you know I, what i'm thinking about is like i said what are the other avenues because again it's one of those things okay. that did come up a lot when the lights went out it was a certainly source of a, a lot of frustration and folks uh, saying that we needed to press rtd to hold the vendor accountable for a lighting system that yes. failed, failed early, um, but there is a strong desire for the community for the lights to come back. So what I would like to do is, I, I don't think I'm comfortable removing it from the budget given the overarching feedback, but I think there's avenues to explore to get the vendor, who again, these were supposed to last for a very long time, so our community isn't ultimately paying for that or isn't paying the entire cost that's on there. So that would be where I would be going. I will not be in support of just straight up removing it, but I am absolutely in support of going back and making sure those conversations are not only deep, but we are looking at all the legal ramifications of if they made a commitment to the warranty of those products, then we need to be holding them accountable to that. So I just wanted to really, before I cast my vote, wanted to make sure to, to share all that. Thank would, you. Would you be interested in pushing back a year and giving them the time so so miss bjorkland go ahead so we can we can hold on that project until we've done that research to find out if uh, um if we can get either the vendor or another source of funding for that project so would that require then at this point if the council would it require a different motion to say that those funds will not be removed from the budget but the project would be put on hold until those and then the next council would then review that to determine budgetary dollar change or no change i just again want to make sure the funds stay there mm -hmm. and stay but i want this conversation to happen and i want it to be with with legal pressing upon what were the contracts and getting involved with rtd to really understand if they're letting a vendor off the hook for something and then the communities needed to pick up the bill. So I really want that conversation to be deep. So from a budgetary perspective, we do not have to make a motion or a change. Um, but what we can do from a staff perspective is we can bring it back to the council to say, this is what we found out and determine if the council is comfortable with that. Council shares I. Uh, yes, thank you. <clears throat> uh, this actually just came up from community advocates at a meeting last week on this. And so luckily we have an RTD representative now who's willing to advocate for this. Uh, we previously did not have that sort of representation that we're advocating for us to hold these vendors accountable. And so it's my understanding we've been having these conversations with RTD. As the Dr. Cog rep, I meet with Marjorie Sloan often. This comes up at all the Jeff Tag meetings from community members. So this is something that's driven by community response. But this is to show a commitment by the city of Lakewood to move this project forward. This is not by any means to cover the entire cost of this. So I think it's ill-founded to just speak uh, without sort of understanding that context and background on it because there has been numerous times even in the, as recent as last week where community members have brought this up so the desire exists in the community and we're lucky to have an rtd rep that's willing to advocate for that as well councillor jansen so this eight hundred thousand dollars is for um just we're not paying for anything. It's just exploratory. We're using this eight hundred dollar, eight hundred thousand dollars to to get RTD to fix it. I'm, I'm confused about what the eight hundred thousand dollars is for. There hasn't been a full scope of the project identified yet. It's identified for um, what wants to be accomplished. 
So, so yeah. that eight hundred thousand dollars would be held for a year until you figure out until they figure out what this what they're going to do. Uh, may not be a year, but okay. <laughs> um, would it be determined during to it twenty twenty four? And then that would be put towards fixing the lights, or it, it hasn't been fully um, defined what that would be. Thank you. All right, it's Councillor uh, Mayor Pro Tem Strom. So, clarifying here, when I have a project pending that I think is coming up or that I want to do, from a savings perspective, I start by setting aside X amount of dollars that I think it might take to accomplish said goal. However, I don't always know at the forefront what exactly the steps are and what the full cost of each one of those would be. Is that what I'm hearing from you is where we've kind of earmarked what we think it will look like, but we won't know exactly until we go through the process and have some conversations again with our RTD advocate. Is, is that what we're looking at here? Yes, and it might be better if Max Kirschbaum answered the question um, because he has more of the detail. He, he's the one that presented the project. I believe he is online. Good evening, Mr. Kirschbaum. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, if, I, if I could just read the simple statement that's in, it, that's on page 14 of the CIPP that Councilor Over mentioned. It says that Public Works will coordinate with RTD and other stakeholders to add lighting and monument signage improvements to the light rail bridge that goes over US Highway 6. We have not initiated uh, contact with RTD uh, yet uh, to resume uh, any progress toward this project. It was approximately a year ago that uh, senior officials at RTD indicated that, um, that uh, at that point in time, such project would be in the city's court to pursue. So the intent of this was to provide a, a, a project amount for design, investigation, construction, just like we would any other project, though we have not either secured a, uh, an agreement with RTD in any way on how funding may be split, uh, nor have we done a detailed cost estimate at this time. Okay, thank you. So there's a motion and a second to remove this item from the capital project list. Please cast your votes. What was the wording of the motion exactly? The, the wording was to remove okay. uh, this project in its entirety from page 14, West Line Bridge at 6th Avenue lighting project. And that fails three to seven, the seven nays being Paul Mayak Guerrero, Stuart, Frank, Strom, Sherazai, Vincent. Okay. Councillor Over. Okay, my last one. Uh, also there, there is on page 13, um, there's a separated bike lanes uh, on Garrison Street, you know, south of Jewel, where they painted the lines on Har on Harlan. Actually, I haven't gone and seen that one. And then on Denver West uh, Parkway, uh, there's $900,000 budgeted to put in upright, I call them upright wiffle ball bats. They're also called stanchions, I think, and low level dividers between the bike lanes and the, um, the street. Well, actually on Garrison, it'd be between the bike lane and the parked cars. Um, as an avid bicyclist, I don't, 
I do love separated bike lanes. I actually talked about this in March and I showed pictures of where it works in Denver, right next to Wash Park. It's some great place examples. And in fact, on the budget, they show a picture of Wash Park. Um, the problem with this one is on Garrison Street, the parked cars are on the outside of the bike lane and that puts the people who live there at great risk of the cars going by on Garrison because Garrison is also now narrowed up just like a lot of our other streets. So when they, the, the biggest problem there is when the people park there, they have to get out in the traffic and their kids on getting out on the other side get out into bicycle lane. And so I just don't like that whole setup at all. Um, I don't know much about Harlan Street. I don't know anything about Harlan Street. I do know Denver West Parkway because that was also one of the things I had sl slides on here back in March. And it's nice, actually. It, it would be a good, sp good place for this kind of thing, except for one really important thing, which is that road goes nowhere. It actually goes out to the um, NREL, National um, Renewable Energy Lab, and stops. And, and think about this, NREL, the big lab, is all uh, barbed wire fences all around, doesn't allow bicyclists to go through. So you can take that Denver Park West, or Denver West Parkway out there, then you have to turn around. <laughs> and so what's the point of spending $900,000 on these two things? So, but I'd like to keep the money this time. So my motion is to take the money from separated bike lanes and put it into a bike lane on Garrison south of Jewel. And that I realize that there's not enough money to do anything there, so I'd like put it into a fund and perhaps next year we can add more to that fund and eventually have something so it actually can make it safer for bicyclists on Garrison. Because we're, we're basically building a Cadillac on Garrison north of Jewel and there's nothing south of Jewel. And that's just backwards. It's not the way to do it. Yeah, I don't think that's, I mean, could you be more specific? So you want to move 900,000 right. to a proposed project south of Jewel on Garrison to where? just a little bit south. I don't know how far, I can, you know, 1,000 feet or something like that. There is no bike lane south of Jewel on Garrison, and it's very dangerous. And I had, I had pictures, and I showed you how bikes have to smash together with, with cars. And so that would actually improve our bicycle connectivity an awful lot because that's a place where you can't get through safely. It would... It would very much make it a lot safer for bicyclists to go from way south in Lakewood to um, north of Colfax, actually. Okay. It's page 13 on the capital improvement budget. Yes. So that would be your motion. Is there a second? Second. All right. Motion and a second. Um, Councilor Macarero. Can I turn my um, thanks. So I, <coughs> I want to just get a little bit of clarity. So when you're talking about the Denver West um, bike lane on this list, oh, I see. It's just it's on the the general location. So there's also then like a, a more specific list of places. Um, so I, I mean, I, I'm oh, sorry. Um, so I think that the idea that we would put this money unvetted into, uh, specific projects that you're not sure whether or not they would cover them when, um, frankly, those are all places that have been brought to our attention for specific reasons. And again, is focused on connectivity. Um, I will also say that personally, I bike more for transportation than for um, leisure, and I think biking for leisure is fabulous. I, I don't mean any any disrespect. 
Um, but biking for transportation, being able to get from the east side of Lakewood all the way into the Denver West area where there's a lot of business campuses, my doctor's office is over there. Um, it's easier to access Colorado Mills from over there. That actually in terms of connecting most of the north part of Lakewood and the east part of Lakewood to um, those really important resources that are all, all west of there, it, it, that is actually a, a road that I've biked on a lot because of using bike, uh, my bicycle for transportation, so uh, rather than for leisure. So I am not in favor of changing these projects. I'm definitely in favor of figuring out how we can increase our bike lane projects over time, um, but unfortunately we don't have that budgeted at this moment. Councilor Stewart. Councilor Stewart. Thanks. Um, I just want to echo those comments. Uh, these, some of these um, potential projects like Harlan Street is in Ward 3, right smack dab in the middle of our ward, which is one of the areas of town that has seen pretty historic underinvestment in infrastructure and pedestrian and bicycle connectivity. So I'm pretty excited about that. I am all for making Garrison safe from top to bottom, though. I would love to find money to fund that whole project because it is one of the only ways to get north to south um, you know in Lakewood across 6th Avenue so would love to would you know obviously $900,000 is not gonna is gonna be a drop in the bucket for a large garrison project like that and again I just want to say that this came about from the community um, folks in our community have been begging for specific bicycle connectivity projects, especially safer protected bike lanes. So I am delighted that this is the first budget that Lakewood has ever put forward that has this in there. Um, so would love to increase, uh, not interested in um, reallocating these funds to a different project. Council Benson. <clears throat> um, I just don't even know how, I, I'm on the budget committee, I realize, but how would that even work? Can we take a chunk of money that's already been allocated, approved by the budget committee, which we have citizen input on and we've already had two budget meetings, can that just arbitrarily be assigned to another bucket without a project attached to it? Um, you, you can identify it as, as the specific project um, he can't have you can't have a separate fund uh, of what you're proposing of you're marking it somewhere else it has to either be in the budget or out of the budget one or the other so okay. um, yes it can be it uh, that technically the council can make that decision of moving it from one place to the other but not to something that's been identified yet. Is that correct? As part of the capital the general practices that you have to have something identified to take it to. Okay. Right. Thank you. Councilor Sherazai. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, this impacts Ward One. You know, Lake, or, um, Garrison Street is where we have many school-aged children traffic or getting to and from school. So having a protected bike lane to Lakewood High School to Creighton Middle School feels critically important. Also, there's a tremendous amount of uh, employees uh, that live in Lakewood that work in NREL. So I imagine that they don't turn around there. I imagine that they're riding their bike to that location. And so I too wouldn't share in the sentiment of removing this as this is an investment that's been desperately needed in Ward 1 in particular because we have so many unsafe routes to schools. Mayor Pro Tem Strom. Thank you. Living not very far away from the garrison slash south of Jewel, I would love to see that a safer bike lane. I drive that almost daily and do acknowledge it is not a safe space for a cyclist. However, in order to create a lane in that space, we are probably looking at moving earth, which I would imagine would cost significantly more than what we had originally planned. What I would ask for is instead of making a change to this year's budget, is that we continue to have these conversations in the planning retreat, like we have how we identified um, multimodal, increasing multimodal infrastructure before, and looking at having that be as next year's plan once we have it a little bit more vetted and have a little better understanding of what the true actual cost will be. 
Councilor Oler, back to the motion, then I'll take a vote. Okay. Um, I think we could actually do this. I mean, like you said, you're in Ward 5, the, the main part in Garrison there is Ward 5, and um, it is unsafe. And we don't need to spend 900000 on something that is a lot safer than that. And so it's, it's really a reallocation of the money. And yeah, I would love to have a millions of dollars to put into bike lanes all over the place. Uh, but like I said, it, we're building a Cadillac in one spot and you have dirt in another. And the dirt actually is at the end of Denver West Parkway because there is no schools, first of all, out there. And, and so, yeah, the NREL people that go to work can use that bike lane, but anybody that wants to go to Golden has to go through Col on Colfax <laughs> or through the, through the parking lot uh, behind uh, the malls there, it, it's, it's massively unsafe to do, go anywhere in through there. So I'm just trying to make things safer for bicycles. Okay, the motion on the floor is to remove the $900,000 off page 13 and reallocate it to a project from Garrison in Jewel south to, I don't know what that first street is, but in that area. Please cast your votes. And that fails seven nay to three ayes. The nays being Paul, Mayat Guerrero, Stewart, Franks, Strom, Sharzai, and Vincent. Okay. Is there anything else? Councilor Jansen. Thank you. All right. So I have another motion. <laughs> I'd like to make a motion to add section 12.12 or 12 .12 to budget page 40 in the 2023 budget and financial policy section. Just so when um, auditors look at that, they'll know that's part of our charter. Second. Where would you like that to go? Um, I don't know. You just have to put it in there so the auditor can see it. So we, okay. Just anywhere? <clears throat> can I borrow that? <laughs> Councilor Franks, go ahead while she's looking. This uh, question is for uh, Ms. Bjorkland. I'm trying to understand um, the uh, tie-in to the charter, because um, certainly uh, those of us up here, the whole charter matters in its entirety. So I'm just trying to understand why we would, trying to understand the impetus of putting a single section in versus saying that um, the auditor should look into our charter for all financially relevant information. It would seem that would be better in order to ensure that as they're auditing us, they're looking at all the um, language that involves financial implications, since that's what they're auditing upon, rather than a specific call out. So I just wanted to sort of understand sort of is that already part of their practice? I know that when we have audit engagements, I work for a private company, those audit engagements are very detailed as far as what's in scope, what's out of scope, documents, whole menus of plans, remediation, controls. I mean, we could go into a lot there. That's all baked into the agreement and into ensuring that you're uh, matching um, uh, best practices for accounting processes. So I want to make sure that, that we're adhering to sort of those things. Is that already where they look at all the financially relevant aspects in order to complete their audit? Um, yes, the simple answer is yes, that, that is the case. Um, the auditors that we hire are specific auditors that uh, understand governments and how governments work. Um, and all the public documents are things that they go and look at themselves. One of those is the city charter. And there are multiple things in the city charter that relate to budget. Um, so they go look at the charter and um, 
look to see if there's things that they need to ask us about or identify. Um, 1212 has never come up as an issue from the auditors. Well, Thank maybe you. maybe because they never saw it. So maybe if it was in the budget book, they would be able to see that and interpret that the way they see it. Um, I mean, I, the way you guys interpret it is not the way a lot of people are interpreting. It's revenue based, and I think you know, I think it's going to come out. It's going to come out about how it's revenue based, and I think it needs to be in the budget book, right under where it says maybe right above where it says the information that follows provide the summary budget financial policies of the following areas maybe in the on the right there you can say in our charter there is a motion or there is a 12.12 12, um, that would has some financial issues that i think they need to look at so that's just my that's my motion so if you want to request putting it in the book, what I would recommend is that you indicate that staff needs to identify where in the book it should be put. In under 24 budget and financial policies. Right, that but area. in terms of what, uh, where we put it within the policies, um, that that's something that we could determine since. Yeah, you'd have to determine where it would fit mm -hmm. in, but I think it would be a good place for an auditor to see that, you know, instead of having to dig through our charter. I'm sure that they have a time limit. Well, there's a lot of different documents that they have to look at, and um, they like to look at things in a whole versus uh, parts of, uh, of you know, whatever the influence is, because let's say 12.12 12, um, would be impacted by another portion of the charter. They want to see the entire charter so that they can make that determination. So by uh, putting in a specific section of it um, may not give them the information that they need. So generally they do go look at full documents. So anything that's a public document, they look at the entire document. Okay, thanks. Yeah, but there's a second, yeah? Was there a second? Okay, so we do need to vote on that. Um, and could you just restate the language that you want please I'd just like to make a motion to add section 1212 to budget page 40 in the 2023 budget and financial policy section okay as as the staff sees fit where it could fit okay I have two lights on Councillor Sherazai and Franks do you wish to speak to that motion I do okay go ahead uh, I have a problem with that though because I think that you're uh, it's clear that you have a, a different opinion on the interpretation but there's also a tremendous amount of field work that goes in from outside auditors including review of the charter so right now we're making accusations on staff's ability to interpret this and, and also an independent auditor who's gone through this process who's gone through field work and so I just think that making sure that the field work, which I assume includes reading the charter, happens, the, having this piecemealed in there because there's a counselor or three that have an interpretation that's different, I think is ill, is maybe not the move because we do, if you want to move through that process with the courts, but you keep, there's been mentioned over and over tonight that there's not been a judgment from the courts because there's never been anybody who's ever sued over this. And, you know, we have counselors in the room that have gone through 10 budget cycles and this has never come up for them. So if this is going to come up, then that needs to go through the courts before we start to add that language because I have to believe that an independent auditor that goes through all that regulation does the necessary field work to properly audit the city. Councilor Franks. I would just echo that. I am currently working on a project that is going through a real-time system assessment. It is going through a I would let you know that it is a very systematized process. It is very thorough, um, and so I would uh, would not be supporting this because I do believe that uh, that field work and that very prescriptive way, uh, this is not folks who just uh, are not working from a playbook. These are folks who understand all aspects and levers and mechanisms and uh, request documentation, but again, often they want to see it as unvarnished. They don't want you to color it they don't they just want to see the the information and so again won't be supporting uh, this tonight thank you mayor pro tem strom councillor stewart 
Councillor Vincent to the motion. One more question. I apologize. There's a little or a lot of bit of redundancy here, but I just wanted to make it explicitly clear that I, I understood you correctly that when an auditor comes to us and they're auditing our records, they are looking at the charter in its entirety. Is that correct? Auditors don't tell us what they're going to go look at. But it's available online and they, okay. Yes. So anything that's a public document, they do not ask us for. They go look for it themselves. And that's intentional so that we're not part of the process, that they're looking at all of our information without us being aware of what they're looking at. So we don't try to change things or look at things differently or that it's unvarnished. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Stewart or Vincent? Yeah, I just want to echo that I have been through multiple audits on the budget and audit committee, but also in my regular day work capacity. And the importance of objectivity is paramount. Um, we don't want to color an auditor's feeling about um, any sort of financial decisions that the city is making in any way, shape, or form because we need them to come back with a very uncolored, clear, and objective evaluation of the financials of whatever organization, whether or not it be a city um, or a nonprofit organization. It's incredibly important to not um, try and color uh, what an auditor is doing and quite frankly that would be difficult to do having been someone who's been through a few audits myself Councillor Vincent yeah rather the same thing and I think that that maybe people out there need to know that we have had feedback from auditors for things that we have to kind of clean up clarify we've been um, nabbed for that's probably the wrong word, <laughs> but it's been identified things that we have to correct. So it's a very robust process. Um, and I too have been through audits where they, um, where you have to sit there for three days and virtually wonder if you're still going to have your job at the end of the audit. So it is a very robust process, but please, I think people out there need to know that we have had the auditors come back and correct us and we have had to do things to, to, um, satisfy those audits so i wanted to let everybody know that okay motion and a second on the stated verbiage please cast your votes and that fails three to seven sevens being paul matt guerrero stewart frank strom sherazai vincent okay Anything else? Okay, could I have a motion to approve the budget as amended? I move for the adoption of ordinance O-2023-41 on second and final reading as amended. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any other comments? on the budget okay I would simply just before go ahead Councillor Springsteen I saw that um, the question I had about the police um, budget uh, was answered in terms of the fleet um, anything that is charged from the fleet would go to whatever department uh, or would be billed to whatever department uses the fleet. I, I was just, I was going back in some prior budgets trying to remember um, And this is just an example, the police department. So in, in 2020, it looked like our budget for the police department was 59,000, no, 59 million, 24,746. And so then I was just trying to compare that 
to this year. And I just wondered if you could um, just kind of state what the comparison would be to 2024 uh, between, I mean, what kind of increase in budget did we have, I guess, is my question. Are you asking what category? Specifically or? for the police department. Right. There, are you asking what category increase from 2020 to 2024? I guess just dollar dollar amount or dollar what amount. percentage increase. That'll take a moment. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And are you asking from budget to budget or actuals to budget? Budget to budget, I think. So 2020 to 2024? Yeah. For easy reference, Councillor Springsteen, you can look at page 255. It isn't going to give you as much as you're asking for, but it does compare actual 2022, 2023, and then budget 2024. I know you're looking back further, which will take a couple of minutes, I believe. But if, in the meantime, if you want to refer to page 255 in the budget, it's got that um, broken out. Okay, I, I see that. I'm right in the right area so it looks like maybe a 10 million dollar increase from 2020 more or less 2020 budget is 62 million oh okay so all right I think 2.3 million increase I think that answers my question thank you Other questions or comments? Councillor Stewart. Thank you. I just wanted to take one more opportunity as the chair of the Budget and Audit Board this last year to thank our Budget and Audit Committee uh, members. Uh, you sat through a couple of long nights and helped us uh, throughout the whole year. So we're incredibly appreciative of both our community members as well as our members on council. And we are so deeply appreciative to um, our staff in the finance office as well for your diligence and your hard work and frankly, your thoroughness. Um, and again, just once again, reflecting the values and priorities that the council has set forth in um, what we're spending on. Thanks. All right, any other comments? All right, I would just close with a couple quick things. Um, certainly would like to thank the community as always and, you know, good conversation about the property tax and, you know, it is 6% of our entire budget. So while it's not a huge amount, it's certainly meaningful. And I think as always, you know, trying to find a middle ground sometimes works and that's what's potentially gonna be voted on tonight. So I appreciate the conversation in regards to that. The charter was written in 1969 and certainly if there are things and we've found things all throughout my tenure, things that probably do need to be addressed or changed. And so I would encourage future councils and the community, that's really a community conversation about looking at a charter cleanup if there are questions moving forward. But I, I will say, you know, police parks and potholes has, has really been the focus. This is my 16th budget. And I think, you know, what I'm proud of is we haven't raised taxes and you have allowed us to keep some Tabor dollars that we've reinvested to the tune of, I think, 13 new parks, almost 200 acres of open space, some meaningful things for our police and certainly infrastructure. So I'm proud of the city team in this final year and all that you've done to help produce these. It's, it's never easy. And, and while some of these ideas tonight, I think have decent merit, it's hard to come on the last night of the budget hearing when we've had a previous one as well as a study session with amendments that might make sense or they could be doable, but trying to do that with little or no time to understand where to move those dollars. So I think you know in the future going forward, that could really mean a lot. And again, I'd echo our thanks to our budget audit folks. I know I see one here, there are two maybe, but we do appreciate that. And I'm excited to support this moving forward. So with that, please cast your votes. 
And that passes seven ayes, three nays, the nays being over, Jansen and Springsteen. Okay. So we are moving right along. Thank you, Holly and team. Thank you. Frame that for you. Yep. So I have a request to take a five minute break, so we'll be back at nine twenty five.
All right, good evening. I'd like to reconvene the October 23rd, 2023 regular meeting of the Lakewood City Council at 9.32 p.m. Appreciate everybody staying here with us. We're going to go ahead and move into our next section, which is general public comment. And uh, just this point in the meeting where the public is invited to address the City Council on items that did not appear on the agenda. All comments should be directed to the City Council. I ask that all in attendance observe the decorum of City Council chambers and refrain from applause or audible support or discord with the speaker. We certainly know there's a lot of interest, and so in light of it, you certainly have your three minutes or some pooling. But if you'd like to just say, I agree with the speaker, that's fine as well. And then as a quick update, I would just uh, like to make sure the community is aware. I know some of you are, but some of you may not be aware of a letter as this pertains to um, our Belmar Park property issue, the 77 South Yarrow Street. And that was a letter that was sent to the mayor and city council uh, dated the 18th of October. That talks about uh, I'm writing to let you know that we'll be pausing on any future site. I make plans. a motion to object to this discourse at this time. You have already called public comment. It's time for public comment. Great. I um, I make a motion to go to public comment. Okay. It dies for lack of a second, and I'm going to continue. Um, with this letter, just so that everybody has the opportunity. We're, we're going to get through this. We're going to get through it civilly. So, again, just to set the table for folks who may not be aware. I appeal the decision of the chair. So, I am writing to let you know that we'll be pausing on any future site submittals for two months to allow for a discussion about this project with the Lakewood community. This is an important step because of the concerns that have been expressed over the past few weeks about our project. We want to be a good neighbor and understand that while a neighborhood meeting was not required as part of our process, we should have worked to have a community discussion because of the importance of the neighboring park. We want to work with residents to listen to their concerns and explore opportunities for potential changes to the project. We have contacted city staff to schedule these discussions and to reach out to concerned residents about participating. During the three years that we have been developing this project, we have come to an understanding, we have come to understand how unique and special this location is and that this formal pause is an important step. We look forward to becoming part of the Lakewood community and want to be a partner in making sure that this project serves as an asset to the community. Okay, so we're not going to have outbursts. We're going to get through this respectfully. I understand there's a lot of passion, but that's how this is going to go, okay? So first up... Okay. So we're going to be done with that, or we're going to be recessing, or we'll ask our police agents to have you step outside. Deal? The police agents? Yeah, they're there. They're out in the back. Yeah. You, may, you may, may not have seen All them. All right. So first up, we have wow. Mr. Mace. Okay, Mr. Mace is gone. Joan Poston? My name is Joan Poston and I have family in Ward 1. I'm here because um, I have been uh, looking into development in Lakewood for some time. As you all know, I did a Freedom of Information Act um, request for the GSA for the land at, um, 50, at the 59 acres at 4th and Union. I have still not gotten that FOIA after a year and one month, but the EPA has gotten involved, so I'm excited. Um, I do want to say 
that when I heard about what was happening with um, the park, that I started to look at who this developer is that's working with this park. First of all, I'm surprised that this has been going on for three years and nobody knew about it. But the other thing that's kind of surprising to me is this. This was put out um, yesterday. Plans appeared scrapped for 37-story tower in downtown Denver. This project was done by the same developer. The developer's name is K-A-I-R-O-I that is working here in Lakewood. This developer is based out of Dallas, which is kind of interesting because the developer that's working <coughs> over on 4th um, and Union is um, based out of Dallas as well. And oftentimes, um, Texas is um, some place where developers go to register when they are um, an international um, entity. Um, I am telling you that perhaps you might want to look a little bit deeper into the roots of this developer and maybe try to understand exactly what they're promising and stuff. Because apparently, I've been working for five years in Denver to build a 37-story tower and really doesn't understand what is acceptable as far as our um, standards here in Lakewood. Um, please listen to these people that are coming after me. They are upset because of the trees. They are upset because there should be some kind of boundary. And most of all, they're upset that we have um, people interfering with this and putting this on a two-month pause, something I have never seen done before. Thank you very much. And I appreciate you listening. Eventually, this FOIA will come through. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, Gail Hamilton, then Linda Stop. Good evening, Gail. Good evening. Yeah. Uh, thanks for letting us speak about sure. this. Um, I, am, I want to address City Council, but also everyone that's stayed long enough to support the Belmar Park uh, itself. Because, you know, for most of us here, we're upset because all of the residents we've all talked to are in Lakewood. And if they've been to the park or if they know anyone that's been to the park, it is... Um, an incredible bird sanctuary. It's a wildlife refuge. It's been that way for decades. <clears throat> and any type of massive development like this one would really destroy what exists there. And if for no other reason, then <clears throat> that uh, proposed development is six stories and it looks like it should be at the uh, TOD project at 13th and Wadsworth, yes, I understand West Colfax, I understand MGU zoning, and we know it's zoned appropriately, but the issue is wildlife, birds, and the ecosystem in the park. It's a natural habitat, it's destructive to all that to develop this kind of project. And why aren't they putting that building which looks like nothing in the area surrounding the park on, on West Colfax or <clears throat> at any other TOD station. Um, so some of the points I wanted to make also was, is that uh, the, um, I believe that the city officials do have an obligation and a duty to protect our habitat areas, our parks, there needs to be a buffer, and the surrounding uh, developments need to coexist um, and be congruent and also homogeneous with all the other surrounding adjacent developments. So we counted up how many single family and townhome units there are around the park, 
and there's something like 450 or thereabouts, and they're proposing 412 units. This doesn't make sense, and nothing is taller than two-story. And so you've got single family, and you've got townhouses, but that's it. So this does, it's not only that it doesn't fit in, uh, I, I mean, it goes against your own building codes. Your codes say uh, that it has to exist or work with the ecosystem, the habitats that supposedly you should be trying to save, not eliminate, and it apparently, w I mean, it would destroy it. So the park as we know it would not be really a park and it would hurt the environment for the whole area. Okay. Thank you. All right, Linda and then Celia. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Uh, I've spoken in front of you before uh, with a group, uh, Advocacy Coalition, called Clean Energy Lakewood. And as you know that uh, we look, I'm not representing them tonight. I, work, I live in Ward 4. I'm here as a citizen who really loves and cares for this city. I've lived here for over 20 years. Um, we have talked to you, and I have talked to you in the past, about our city government focusing and funding clean energy, conservation, and enhancement of our natural environment. And this includes preserving Belmar Park. And we just can't allow this construction to occur. It definitely is going to destroy the entire area. As you've just heard, and we've been receiving a lot of correspondence of people that have been telling you about this, that it definitely would tarnish this jewel. Belmar Park is a jewel for the city of Lakewood. And putting that construction in there would tarnish it. So I would really like to propose that the council, the mayor, and the city manager find the means to purchase this land, to stop it and buy it, and, <laughs> and make it part of Belmar Park. Continue, you know, continue on, add to Belmar Park. We don't need any more of these condos. We don't need them there, particularly there. I think we are really going backwards instead of forwards on our sustainability plans if we allow this kind of development and to destroy that jewel. So I think we, all of us really value the natural beauty and culture of this city. And we are in line with Mary Bonfies, who gave us this wonderful jewel. So let's save Belmar Park. All right, thank you. Okay, one more time, we're gonna start taking breaks, please. Okay, Ms. Greenman, come on down. And then I have uh, Ms. Whittier. Hello, Good Mayor evening. and City Council. Uh, regarding the property that's proposed for development at 777 South Yarrow, Zoning Ordinance 17.6.5.8 says existing trees with trunks greater than 8 inch caliber within a development shall be preserved to the extent reasonably feasible, feasible and uh, such trees shall be considered protected trees. Streets, buildings, and lot layouts shall be designed to minimize the disturbance to protected trees. The tree removal is also contrary to Lakewood's sustainability plan to achieve tree canopy of 30% by 2025. So I would like to know why there has apparently been no pushback from city employees and city council to instruct the developer to design a plan with the trees and not destroy them. Destroying 69 trees is not minimizing anything at all. The Municipal Code 14.16.040, calculation of parkland dedication. Based on this calculation, the developer owes the city 
3.3 acres of parkland. However, we're informed that the city has opted to accept an in lieu of cash offer from the developer, which will involve removing green space south of the library and paving it for a parking lot. Now, which city bureaucrat made this decision and why is it acceptable? The comprehensive plan has a goal that was just stated by one of the previous speakers, that through the site plan review process, it is to ensure that new multifamily and commercial developments adjacent to single family neighborhoods are compatible by incorporating appropriate design, scale, height, transition, and connectivity to seamlessly integrate with the neighborhood. As was stated, the surrounding area is parkland and townhomes. The five-story Belmar West project that will house over 1,000 people and 500 plus cars is not compatible with the current land use. And I want to know why people on city staff are unilaterally making these de decisions that are against what the people of Lakewood want and what is stated in the city ordinances, municipal code, and plans. I ask you not to accept this project. Thank Great. you. Thank you. All right, Ms. Whittier and then Ms. Hopkins. Good evening. Good evening, and my name is Karen Whittier, and I'm from Ward 5. I have lived in Lakewood, the same house, for 55 years. I was an art teacher at middle schools in Jefferson County, and I also used to take photos of May Bomfy's property and then have my students paint those pictures. Now, as time goes, I have seen the big lane that went to the Golden Gates to the big mansion gone. Those trees are gone. I have seen such changes there. And the buildings that are there now are kind of getting trashy. Why we can't have that property be part of the beauty of that park, the high rise the project is for luxury apartments or condos, whatever you want to call them, and they are not what Lakewood is. We are not luxury people. We are normal Americans, and we do not want to have that kind of thing there. I hope that you find a way that we do not have that project, period. It's broken my heart to see already the change in that area from just the office buildings. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, Ms. Hopkins, then I have uh, Richard, I can't read the last name, but on West Ford Drive. Good evening, Council. My name is Regina, and I stand before you this evening to share my personal perspective on the crucial endeavor to safeguard Belmar's unofficial bird sanctuary. It is with a sense of concern that I address the council, for it seems that there has been a misguided attempt by two of its members to claim credit for a grassroots movement that they chose not to engage in or support. To imply that Wendy Strom and Rebecca Stewart were the main reason for the developer's pause supposedly achieved through their tireless efforts to reach a compromise is misleading. In reality, it was the unwavering dedication and tireless work of our entire community that compelled these council members to take notice of our cause and arrive at this pivotal moment. The public's outcry and the momentum we've generated around this vital issue have propelled us to where we stand today. In decisions, particularly those of significant public interest and transparency, 
Transparency and fairness should be the guiding principles. When these principles are not upheld, it's the city council's responsibility to intervene and assert this is not acceptable. In the spirit of transparency, I wish to clarify the purpose of the resolution to be presented this evening. First and foremost, it does not aim to nullify or amend existing ordinances. It, instead, it seeks to uphold the, the current ordinances and establish an additional set of guidelines for the developer. They are not mutually exclusive. Its, its purpose is to prevent the potential abuse and discretion and enhance the checks and balances within our decision-making process. As council members, you are entrusted with safeguarding the interests of the public, particularly in the face of substantial projects such as the one before us. This is a moment that calls for your unwavering commitment to reflect the will of the public who have granted you the authority to act in the best interests of the community you represent. Council members, I urge you to approve this resolution. We must protect our 69 trees. I implore you to not be swayed by any misinformation or misleading narratives that suggest you cannot vote on this motion for resolution. It is well within your purview to cast your votes tonight. Let's unite as a community and endorse a proposal that serves our best interests. The strength and unity of our voice are evident in the number of people gathered here tonight. Thank you for your attention and consideration as we work together to preserve the interests of our community and the crown jewel of Lakewood. Thank you. All right. So Richard? Richard Danley. Danley, come on down. And then uh, John, I'm sorry, on South Floor, South Flower. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for all your hard work, everyone. Um, I reside in Ward 3 at the base of Belmar Park at the Belmar Estate Stanton Hill Development, recently opened up in 2003. Um, I'm here to, first of all, announce that there is a body of interested professionals. The Belmar Park Preservation Group, LLC, has come together to do some interrogatory work to discover any missteps, any misappropriations, any mistakes that may have been made by the council in the decision-making process, a body in this effort to develop this mammoth property that's absolutely undesirable and unpurposeful in the Belmar Park facility. Um, I feel strongly that the community that stands behind me is going to be the foot soldiers of our effort and we have every effort and intention to come to you and gain the insight of the materials, documentation, timelines, expenditures, and decisions that have been made that will help discover how this came to be and how it will absolutely fold. I think what's happening here is I see a Goliath 7 sitting before me, and behind me I see David. And I think that the Belmar Park Preservation Group will be the slingshot. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right, John. John on South Flower Circle. Still with us? Okay. I have Todd, uh, Todd Allen, and then uh, Connie Reddig. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. I moved uh, to Lakewood about two years ago from the East Coast. Um, I'm not here for the reason most people are, although I do support saving Belmar Park. Um, I do get the articles, I do read them. Um, the fact that it's even a serious proposal baffles me. Um, if you're working for the people of this area, I, I just can't even fathom it. This is so far out from everything else I see in this area that it just doesn't even make sense. What you're gonna do about traffic it doesn't make sense. It's a beautiful park here. It's something special. I think you should protect it um, or else you'll end up like most places on the East Coast, which is a head start where we don't have any parks left. We don't have sidewalks. We don't have these things because we built up before those became priorities and now there's buildings in the way you can't put things there. So if you do that, you can't, there's, there's, it's really hard to go back. Now this leads me to why I'm really here. When I first moved here, 
I moved here because I love the nature, I love the mountains, I love the Lakewood's proximity to all that. I love it's, it's, it's ideally situated between the mountains and Denver. It's great. I was very shocked, however, when after a few months of moving in, I received a letter in the mail from the Lakewood police saying that a pedophile was living in Morse Park. Now where I'm from, that would have been a different letter from the police because if they had sent a letter out saying there was a pedophile in our park, they would have then had to up police presence to protect that person. Our letter would have read where I came from, we found a pedophile in the park and obviously because we have common sense, we removed said person. So my daughter used to go to that park. It now belongs to a pedophile. Thank you very much for that. Why I'm here on top of that is Sunday morning I went for a bike ride yesterday. What I saw on these bike paths is atrocious. It's scary. It's not compassionate. I understand it. Y'all think it's coming from a place of compassion, some of us. But throwing people a tent and a rolling suitcase and then watching them kill themselves on our streets is not compassion. I am 6'2", 200 pounds. If I am scared to ride my bike, how can I send my wife and my daughter out there? I don't have an answer for this. Maybe bikes, you know, bike cops riding down these bike paths. I'm glad that we have a few people here that ride bikes. One in my ward. Um, but something has to be done about this. Our parks need to be taken back. We can throw millions of dollars building bike paths, building parks, things like that. It's not gonna matter if we give them away. I do wanna be compassionate, but this is not the way to do it. We don't give away all of our resources, everything we have, and then we all have to, we can't ride the, the light rail, we can't use the parks, we can't use the bike paths. This is why everything's dying in those aspects. We need to make it safe so that families can come back out and enjoy this beautiful city that we have. Thank you. Great, thank you. Connie? Connie, come on down. And then I think I have Paula after South Allison Street. The first thing I want to say is, oh, I don't see my picture up there. Oh, the first thing I want to say is that um, under the ADA law, I would like to bring up the fact that why is it only certain people were uh, blacked out and not everybody? Not the mayor, not Rebecca, not the lawyers. So if you're going to have an ADA law, have it for everybody. And I come first because how many times have I come in here and talked to you about a reasonable accommodations and what did you say to me? Absolutely nothing. They have not been following the ADA laws, the federal laws, the state laws. Now, there are several people on this panel that say, oh, they want to save money and charge more uh, taxes and because they want more money for the state. While I'm part of the state, I uh, uh, deserve reasonable accommodations. When uh, I gave them several papers showing how I was being discriminated against, the mayor is over, what is it? West Metro Solutions? Now, I don't know how a government job would be given to the mayor, which is a state job, and so not following federal and state laws, is that right because I get discriminated against? Because how many people of color are in here? I happen to be indigenous, I happen to be black, I happen to be a Latino woman, and I have had to suffer like I'm not privileged, so why is it that there's only certain laws for people other than people of color? They don't deserve to have reasonable accommodations. They don't uh, deserve uh, to have housing. They don't deserve to be able to come up here and speak. No, they don't. 
And last uh, t meeting that I was in, they all know that I'm indigenous. Did any of, of the people in here that were indigenous, did the mayor call up here to tell him, oh, we respect that this is your land? And part of it also, Belmar Park is indigenous. And um, my understanding, when it is given, uh, donated, and they're not going to use it for that purpose, it has to go back to the indigenous people. So. There's so, a lot of questions as to all the fraud that has been going on here. And I really would like to see all these people on the panel, why it is that only certain people, I want to thank, first of all, Charlie Abel, that really listened and helped our community. I would like to thank Anita Ms. Springsteen. Renick, your because time's she, up. If you could wrap up your comments, please. Wait a minute. Remember last time? I told you I wanted a reasonable accommodation because you never give me enough time to speak. But yet you could uh, bring uh, other people and give them the time to speak. Now, the ADA law, you wanted it for your staff member so because he had a, a visual problem. Well, I have a talking problem. And so I asked you since the last okay. meeting that I wanted Reddick, a reasonable please, accommodation. Please wrap up your time. Thank you. That is not fair to me. Everybody gets three minutes. No, that's it's not fair to me. Not been, everybody is in my situation. They're not disabled. Know. Okay. You said that you, you just wrap abide up your comments, by the please. federal laws. Thank you. All right. See, this is how, how it goes on. Paula? And after Paula, I have Linda. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Paula Nystrom. I live in Ward 5. Um, I am in support of the resolution of saving the 69 trees, but it goes well past 69 trees. If you have never walked through Belmar Park beyond the heritage site, which would also be completely uh, damaged by this development, um, you need to do so before you pass any, you approve any development of this, of this nature. The lack of transparency and the lack of a strategic plan for development in Lakewood is really scary. The fact that this initiative is even being considered is scary. Um, in order to stave off climate change, stop climate change, we can't stop what's already happened, but out of the eight billion people on the planet, every person would have to plant six trees. Eliminating 69 mature trees and the downstream environmental impacts that would be caused by the building going on is going to go well past those 69 trees. It's going to affect the lakes in the area. It's going to scare off the wildlife. And it's going to have a larger implication. You need to ask yourselves, what planet are you leaving for your children and your grandchildren? And if this isn't your backyard, then you need to walk through that park and take that to heart and keep it into consideration for these types of measures. There's no strategic plan here. We keep approving more div div subdivisions, no solar panels, no trees being planted. Instead of zero escaping, we're putting grass in. Take a look at Red Rocks Ranch. Where's the water coming from, right? There's no retention, pl uh, retention ponds for sprinkler systems. There's no reservoirs being built. We're just putting up condos, luxury condos, which is not what the city needs. They need, we need affordable housing, and we need to be considerate of all people in all communities in this uh, city. So please take that to heart and think about the planet. Great. Thank you, Linda. And then uh, Laura Lee, and then Leticia. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for those that are, this is the last night. We really appreciate your time that you've given to the city. Ah, oh, Mary Bonfies, boy, she's just about turning over in her grave, isn't she? I would be. This is a place, I have grandchildren. I have great grandchildren. I own a unit over in the Villa, uh, Villa West area. And one of the reasons that I really like it over there is because of the park. 
I'm a Denver native. I hate to see anything that is being ruined that's going to take away from the enjoyment that my family can have. And we ride our bike over. We go to that concert in the park. We enjoy all of those items that are already there. And boy, can you imagine what it's going to really be for the people at the concert in the park? That's going to be pretty crummy. Or else the people in the apartments are going to have a really good seat. Either way, it's not fair to anybody. And one of the things that, that kind of was ironic, I got my t uh, Tabor check, I'm sure a lot of people did this week. I find that the fact that we got the Tabor checks right before the election, uh, gosh, that's, that's interesting. And then we get a, a stay of execution because they're going to put everything else on hold until after the election. I bet you these people are just thrilled because we get to have an extra bit of time to think about it now. And I'll tell you, as soon as that's going to happen, those trees are going to be coming down like pickup sticks. What a ridiculous thing to do to such a beautiful area that is in the middle of our town, right next to our city government offices. What are we trying to do? I wish that, uh, that we could get a lawsuit going just to sue this, maybe just city council for approving it. That'd be great. But I think that we need to do something that's going to be a little more extreme to put a stay of execution onto the park so that it doesn't get killed and that you're not out there picking up all the dead ducks and stuff like that. I think we should take the $900,000 that was going to be utilized for fixing up the 6th Avenue Bridge. We can buy it back from the developers. I'm sure they didn't. I'm sure they didn't pay $900,000 for the land. But I think we need to take that money and put it back over into our park. Um, yes. Let's do something constructive like that. It's really kind of funny about the bridge because for 10 years, and I think I've spoken to you about this, Mr. Mayor, and I have a picture of it. I, I can certainly show it to you. The fourth light on the Alameda Bridge going over 470 on the south side of the, of the bridge still has been broken for 10 years and it's never been fixed. I've got pictures of it. Okay. Took them on Thank Monday you. or Sunday. Anyhow, All right. vote no on HH. Laura Lee. Thank you. <laughs> Laura Lee. Are you still with us? Uh, Leticia. Good evening. And then Lynn Kinney. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you for listening. This is my first time. I apologize if I'm not going to do it right. <laughs> I um, am here because I promised my students I would show you their sign. Very cool. Save our trees and birds, Belmar Park. Um, you're going to get a lot of really good um, sort of rational, logical reasons to support Councillor Springsteen's uh, resolution, which I do hope you'll pass tonight. Um, but I can't bring anything to you right now that's not just an emotional, spiritual plea on behalf of the children that I work with. I've been in public education for 28 years, and I coach a lot of teachers um, in Denver and other places um, around the nation, actually. And I constantly witness students going through lessons about the state of our environment, the state of our political structures, our economic structures, um, global conflicts, et cetera. And there are first graders <laughs> that are worried about, the, about water pollution and the air for their own grandchildren. These kinds of things are what we are subjecting our children to. We're putting the responsibility onto them. And it is one of the reasons I'm convinced that we have so much depression and mental illness in our kids um, from very young ages. They really are living in a, in a context where we are giving them things um, that they see no way out of improving. And so I just wanted to bring to bear also the um, a statement that's attributed to Chief Seattle. It's very famous, but I think it's really re relevant, which is that we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. 
and we do not own this park and these wetlands. We do legally, but we actually are just stewards of it right now. And so I encourage all of you to do whatever you can that is, has integrity in terms of what we are borrowing from the future generations. If we tear down 69 old growth, old growth trees and take away more wildlife habitat, more birds at least leave, if not die en masse, that is, we are taking, we are stealing that from our own children. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, Lynn, and then Lenore, and then Barbara Millman. Good evening, thank you everybody. Um, my name is Lynn Kinney, and I'm in Ward 5. So I have a couple things, and Regina, she did it really well. We shouldn't be taking credit for something that we really didn't do. These people did it. We were the ones that we got together, we wrote the letters, we researched it all. So I just want to make that clear. Okay. I was a public servant for almost 40 years, and I worked with developers. I have never, ever had a project put on pause. And that scares me, because I think what's going to happen, but we don't know. Of course, we won't know until after the fact. Is he going to be charging liquidated damages? That's two months that could be accrued of liquidated damages. He's losing money. There's no reason for him to put this project on pause. So something is going on. So think about that. I mean, I don't know what he said. We just know what he put in the letter. So I want you to think about that because, you know, that's $23 in my pocket. And I don't think that's right either, but I'll, I'll write you about that. Okay, I've lived in Lakewood my whole life, 64 years. I can't, it's, it's unfathomable what's happened to our city and you've allowed it to happen. We come here, we write you letters, we tell you, no, no, change it, do something. And you keep doing it. When is it gonna stop? You guys have to take responsibility. We put you in office. I got one minute. We put you in office. We are your constituents. Listen to us. Don't turn your head when we're talking to you. Look us in the eye and say, yes, we hear you. That's it, thank you. Thank you. All right, Lenore, and then Barbara, then Lynn. First of all, my deepest thanks to Mary Jansen and Anita Springsteen. You will be greatly missed. For the past two council meetings, well-informed and passionate constituents have appeared before this body to present you with facts and feelings about the Belmar Park development. Their concerns were wide-ranging, from public health and safety to environmental impact. How the city has handled this issue is also being questioned. Since the last council meeting, Councillor Stewart, who said she had quietly been working with the community members on this project for over a year, entered into a partnership with our Mayor Pro Tem Wendy Strom to take action, claiming our voices had been heard. At the end of last week, they shared, and I quote, incredibly exciting news, unquote, because the developer from the Belmar project was willing to meet with concerned residents and place a two month pause on moving forward with their plans. I wonder when the clock started ticking for that time frame. Additionally, when did anyone commenting online or in person request an in-person dialogue with the developer. The people want action 
And that is what Councillor Springsteen's resolution provides. The dialogue should be in addition to, not a replacement of the resolution. The developer, developer's offer provides no guarantee of anything. It has no teeth. It is a short-term attempt to appease us. On the other hand, the resolution is very specific in reflecting the community's concerns and places no specific time limit on the pause. The people want passage of this resolution tonight. Councillor Stewart said, and I quote, the groundswell of community voices have been heard by your city councillors, unquote. Yet because of council's previous responses under similar circumstances, I suspect we will be subjected to numerous excuses to justify the majority's denial of the wishes of the community. They'll say our hands are tied. There's nothing we can do. There will be fabricated procedural problems or maybe a suggestion to just meet with the developer and see how it plays out. The public is tired of waiting and demands action now. You tout the importance of community engagement and claim our voices are being heard. Prove it with your vote tonight. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, Barbara. And then uh, Lynn, is Lynn still here? I think Lynn Judson left. And then if you haven't signed up to speak, please see Mr. Rob. Good evening. Good evening. I was the one who was uncivil, but I would like to say that I felt... Uh, Let's get your time started. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I felt that I was responding to a lack of civility towards my friend and a woman I greatly admire, as do many people here, Anita Springsteen. And I've, this is my third meeting. I had no... I had not come here before. And consistently, you did not ever acknowledge her and her intentions and her resolutions, and that's why I was uncivil. Good evening. <laughs> I'm Barbara Millman, 30-year resident of Ward 2. I bet most of you have a dog or a cat or maybe even a bird. You would never abuse your pet or imagine anyone else doing that to their pet. Your indifference, or better yet, hostility to wild birds confounds me. You have approved a gargantuan building that would destroy significant bird habitat at a time when the U.S. and Canada have lost 2.9 billion adult breeding birds since 1970. The largest single driver of the decline of the bird population is the loss of habitat due to development and other causes of habitat loss. Birds are very sensitive to movement and sound. The construction of 777 South Yarrow with loud noises for several years and the eradication of 69 trees that birds use will ensure that many will fail to thrive and die. What is the difference between this and the abuse of a pet? Thank you. Uh, Lynn, again? Nope. Uh, Lynn A. James? And then, is it Dan Walters on 8th? Good evening. I've spoken to you once before, a few meetings ago, about Belmar Park. And I have a picture here from one of our city maps. And this is 
the area of the city. This is a picture that is City of Lakewood Parks open space. Can you try and talk in the microphone? Can you try and talk in one of the mics, please? Okay. Thank you. This is a picture from a map of the City of Lakewood that shows the parks, open space, and facilities. And this is the area of the city. It's not the center of the city, but it is the area that has our civic center in terms of the buildings, um, the city building, the heritage center, our cultural building, our police, fire buildings. And in here is a white space all of the other parks that have lakes and all that kind of have a pretty nice border, but we have a piece that we don't own as part of the park. And that's a hard problem, because if we owned it, we wouldn't have someone trying to develop housing on it. I talked before about moving. There are other parts of the park, particularly down in this corner, that um, are grassland. They don't, they're not bird habitat. Um, they would more likely be um, animals we'd rather not have there, but we don't have in the park, fortunately. And I have gone to the city um, library, Belmar Library, and taken out this book that was published in 2019 regarding a half century of transformation at our time point of 50 years. We're at 54 years. And what I want to ask tonight is um, what it says in this book is in terms of the history of the city that um, Lakewood's green spaces define the city it's parks, green belts, and open spaces, open glimpses of the same breathtaking landscape that has attracted generations. Contemporary residents can thank Lakewood's early elected officials, community leaders, and residents um, for their foresight and hard work. And it goes on to say, that in 2018, we had a quarter of the land of the city dedicated to parks, open spaces, and trails. And with that much parkland, isn't there some other city land that could be used for a building like this? And I want to say, think about 50 years from now, that will be 20,073, three almost three quarters of the way into this century. Time's up. And, Thank you. Um, what's better in that space? A 50-year-old building or a parkland that's been Great. preserved? Great. Thank you. All right, Dan Walters. Good evening. Evening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, being a professional wildlife photographer, I've been photographing Belmar Park for the past 30 some years. And I have seen everything from American avocets, uh, nesting great blue herons, bald eagles, red tailed hawks, uh, snowy egrets, black crowned night herons. In the wintertime, you get migratory ducks coming in, such as uh, common golden eyes, hood of megansers redheads, canvas backs, and they all use that as a good feeding source. And I think what's going to happen is you have that large building there and that big influx of people, these birds may not come back there and they're going to find another place to nest or hopefully find another place to nest and feed. But right now that's such a good spot for these birds. Let's just do everything in our power to kind of protect that. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So I have uh, Jed Phillips. And then Krista Munson. And again, if, if you haven't signed up, please sign up with Jay. Good evening. 
So I wrote things down this time because the last time I came up here I had some significant stage fright that was a little bit uh, unexpected. Um, so I'm a Ward 3 resident living down on South Estee Street. But I've moved around a lot. I've uh, lived in and in the shadows of Boston, Philadelphia, Sh Chicago, and San Francisco. Um, this is actually the first place that I've been able to stay for multiple years, which is very nice. And I hope that I can stay here for many more. Plan on it. Um, I've also been attending, uh, I've attended city council meetings at these other cities. Um, and while these cities are very separate geographically, they all have similar discussions about land use. So in regards to the Yarrow Street development, a lot of conversation has been had about uh, land and habitat, lo habitat loss, but I'm not hearing enough about the Belmar Trailhead project, um, which will actually be taking land from the park, public land, not private land, stuff that we have control over, and turning it into pavement, <laughs> parking lots, um, for just like a modicum amount of new parking. Uh, I don't understand why, um, I don't understand why we would want that, uh, especially when that parking could be easily accommodated, given that it's allocated for, uh, for transient events, you know, cider days and so on. Uh, that could be accommodated by the other parking infrastructure in the area set up with thought out shuttles during those events. So uh, I thoroughly object to the Belmar parking trailhead. Furthermore, uh, so sec secondly, uh, what I heard from last city council meeting uh, was a very familiar set of arguments as to what I've heard from the other city council meetings in these other cities that are struggling with um, homelessness and housing crises. And while there are a lot of good arguments, uh, while there are a lot of good arguments, there are also some arguments that concern me uh, from my fellow community that uh, these, uh, sorry, <laughs> so, I guess my conclusion here is that I'm worried that some of the arguments against Yarrow Street are echoes of what has inadvertently caused housing crises in the other cities I've lived in. And I would not like to see that here uh, because it's devastating to the communities. Um, I think there are valid reasons for opposition to Yarrow Street, um, but those aren't the reasons that I'm hearing. <laughs> so uh, that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Krista? Good evening. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, my name is Krista Munson. I live in the Iber neighborhood. I walk in Belmar Park most days of the week. I believe in the right to, to private property, but I also recognize that it is not an unlimited right. You would not be happy. You would not give me permission if I wanted to build an 80 story building on the residential lot where I live, I'm pretty sure. And I hope that you will take that to this project as well. There are limits on what we should do with our land. 777 South Yarrow is a particularly sensitive area. The number of units proposed, the five stories in height, the footprint, the traffic have all been spoken to. But there's another piece, the visual impact on that jewel of a park. As a health professional, I recognize the importance of that park in particular for the mental health of the community. It is a place where people go to de-stress. It is in one of the more concentrated areas of the city. Yes, there are other green spaces and open spaces, some that are even larger. This one is unique for where it is, for having water, for having the birds, and for people being able to get to it easily and quickly for their time in nature and their exercise. It's important. One environmental impact that has not been spoken to is birds hitting the glass because it's reflecting or because it's lit up. This is on a migration path. So 
Some have said it's too late in the project to consider public input and, and potentially denying uh, a permit for the project. But there have not been opportunities for public input. If there had been, I might buy that argument. But without earlier public opportunities, and I certainly haven't heard of any, and certainly there's been no, uh, no posting of opportunities at the park, which is the most logical place. So without an opportunity for public input, I can't see it as too late to consider whether this project should move forward. We need this public input, a full public meeting. And personally, speaking only for myself, under a number of conditions, I would not oppose a project on that site. But it would have to be small, fewer units. It would have to include a percentage of affordable housing, housing, and it would have to protect the environment at every step of the project. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, Mr. Rob, do you want to um, read off your list, please? Sure. Mark uh, Kosmanoff. And again, please, if you haven't signed up, see Mr. Rob, because we'll be going to the phone here in a minute. Good evening. Hello, first meeting, don't know the procedure, and I'm not really sure how much power you guys have to oppose this project. Just really how excited you can get. I think I might be in three, so I'm not even sure that a uh, few people have said some of the things I've wanted to say about the birds hitting the glass, the photographer back, back there, but I'm from University of Montana. I'm a graduate in wildlife biology with a specialty in migratory waterfowl. I was interested in that I'm 10 years old. That, that park over there has got more migratory ducks than any body of water I have ever seen. He mentioned canvasbacks and redheads. There are gadwall, shovelers, blue-winged teal, cinnamon teal, green-winged teal, uh, buffleheads. Uh, I could go on, and I can give you all the shorebirds, too. I have never seen such a concentration of wildlife for some reason in that area, in what they call a riparian habitat, where you've got niches. You've got the water, open water, and then you've got the little hills, and you've got the You've got the cattails, and that's why it's so abundant in wildlife. And we got to save that. You know, those birds hitting those windows, and the people that are going to be moving there, all those people with their cats and dogs and their sprays, all of that kills the insects and everything of which, when I was a kid, there was nine to ten times more birds than what we see now. Now, it all comes down to money, and I'd be glad to become involved in that and volunteer to raise money, buy out that piece of property. And I'm pretty good at it. You, it's, this is all going to come down to money. So, uh, developers are going to come to you and say, you know what? Oh, I want to be the partner. I want to work with the people. And they're going to want to present you with this money and all these advantages to it. Don't do it. Thank you. All right. Next, I have Bill Keys. Then Mark Smith can go after Mr. Keys. Okay. Jump up here if you want. Good evening. I hope I have the right word. But I think the city of Lakewood made a proclamation to say Bear Creek Lake Park. Mm -hmm. Now the city of Lakewood has the opportunity to save Belmar Park. Thank you. Great, thank you. Mark Smith. Yeah, thanks. Hi, thank you for the opportunity. Hi, thanks for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, my name is Mark Smith. I live in Ward 
0.5 miles as the crow flies from beautiful Belmont Park is an absolute gem. I think you know that. Persons have been there. We all know it's a, it's a huge gem. And it's not just city residents. Um, I painted a house up in Arvada a couple of years ago. I was a city planner for 20 years. I painted a house up in Arvada and I was talking about Lakewood Parks and the Arvada resident said to me, yeah, Belmont. I said, I live near Belmont Park. And she said, you're really lucky. I go there a lot. This is our Arvada resident. So it's not just a Lakewood. It's just like Green Mountain, Bear Creek Park, Green, Bear Creek Greenbelt. Those are way more than just municipal users and municipal, uh, uh, they're regional gems. Um, so uh, Belmar has very unique and special characteristics as has been noted tonight. Uh, the first I heard, my, my notes are not highly organized. The first I heard of um, the whole uh, development project, I'd heard a few months ago, but the first meeting I heard about was a week ago Tuesday. Uh, a week ago tomorrow night, the 17th, was a, I guess was organized by Anita and um, Regina and some other folks. I was there. One of the things that really struck me was this project is 18 months in or two years in, and this is the first citizen meeting. I was kind of flabbergasted. And I don't mean that critically. I mean, there's been a huge lack of public process. You guys are not the decision makers on this project. I get that. It's a staff level decision, which is very problematic unto itself. And I realize that former actions, historic prior actions have been taken as I understand it, the strategic growth initiative and the fact that this was an urban renewal district so that cut it off, it put it at staff level review. But the fact that the developer, okay, it's at staff level review, staff have a lot of expertise and decision makers, whether they're elected or appointed, often follow staff. But the fact that this has never gone through any public process until this point, and now the developer's gonna say, boy, I got X invested. I totally appreciate developers' interest in reaching out, I think that's in, open hand that this community ought to accept. However, it does concern, and I, I, I want to look optimistically at that, but it also concerns me that I want to be a good neighbor, somebody says, but I'm contacting you two years in or 18 months in or 480 days in when I've invested X. The scale of this project, I'm, I got to wrap up here. The scale of this project, developers have rights to develop their property, I get that. There's nothing the matter with developing the property, but it, the scale of this project, as I know it right now, is way, way out of bounds with if you could harmony wrap, with the you area. Wrap it up, please. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I'm gonna let uh, Mr. Leonard Maglachetti go ahead. Okay. My hat off. I hope my hair is okay. Uh, we've been here for quite a while, so uh, we need a little chiropractic exercise. Can the council go like this? Like this? Can the council do this? Mayor, can you do that? Let me see. Can you do that? You had it. Can you do this? No. No, you can't do that. That is true. No up and down. Has any member run to the mayor with this project and said, no, this cannot go? Or how many of you knew about this and said, this is a wonderful project. Let's move forward with this. We can make some money. Has anyone here on city council, any one of you oppose this? Can anyone answer that question? Do you have, that's not hard, is it? Can you say, I mean, yeah, I, I supported it. Can you say that? Jeslyn, can you say that? Can, the answer is simple. It's either yes or no, right? Well, we'll, we'll circle back to the conversation yeah. after this, so please keep going. We never circle back. Uh, it, would have been, it would have been nice if you would have run to him and say, hell no, this must not go. This should stop. Is there any project that comes before this council or the city government that you say no to 
or enough is enough? Probably not. Why must you continue to not serve the citizens of Lakewood, but serve what I believe are special interests? This project has to do with money and power. It has nothing to do with any of this other stuff. It has to do a lot with the environment. But apparently the environment is not paramount here. The project is paramount. That we get it through, it's time to end both, power and money. If this body had any concern for its citizen, it would have made this issue first on the agenda tonight and not the budget first. So therefore, the answer is, now, let's, let's wave the silly wave. I, I, I firmly believe that this council, many on the council here, do not really support and believe in the citizens that you are supposed to represent. You're too quick to not make your own decisions, but allow your decisions to be made by others and by others. I'll wrap it up, Mayor. In closing, I would like to say, uh, it's nice to see you going to Denver. Thank you. Enjoy the rising crime. Cody okay. Frazier, and then Rebecca Medina. Welcome. Hello. Hi, I'm Cody Frazier. I'm 24. I moved here six years ago. Um, I'm mostly only speaking because there's a lack of youth voice. It seems to be this is my first city council meeting. Um, I moved here first um, to Lakewood Ward 3 across from O'Kane Park. And a lot of the reason I moved here is because Denver from the outside is seen as a place with a lot of nature, habitat coexisting with a booming economy. And so it makes for a good up and comer, youth entrepreneur type to come into the workforce. But as I, you know, work day in jobs out of the Belmar, a lot of them I noticed don't even have the affordable housing already within the Belmar, like you can't work in the Belmar and live in the Belmar at the same time. So letting them then turn another park into an apartment building that is then gonna be marketed as, it's by a park, it's in the Belmar, to where then they can charge higher rents than they already do in the Belmar, doesn't really make for a sustainable society. And I'm mostly just pre-rolling off the top of my head, but it doesn't make for something that the youth looks forward to, and it doesn't make for something that the people that have lived here for so long are able to support and get behind. Because why would you then raise the tax by 7% on properties to make it that much more out of reach for the youth to buy homes, but then take the millions of dollars that they take to buy a property just to build an apartment complex? And it's, prob and it's a lot more money than the 900000 that you guys are bantering about to save one park or save one bike lane, why do that if then you're gonna turn around and not save the parks that are already there? Why renovate new ones? Why build bike lanes if they don't have anything to bike to, if they're going to that one to avoid this one at that point? And that's all I really have to add on the main. Great, yeah. thank you, thank nicely you. done. Okay. Rebecca Medina. Good evening, members of council, mayor. I've been a proud Lakewood resident and Lakewood advocate since 2002. Belmar Park is an escape from the city life in the city. It is a natural, peaceful reprieve and a safe haven for human, humans and wildlife alike. 
It is the first place I take visitors to spotlight my city, and people are simply awestruck. No other place exists like it's so close to roadways and shops, and you'd never know it. A five-story luxury apartment building up to Coon, budding up to Coons Lake will inherently change this natural landscape and sorrowfully, sorrowfully destroy the natural habitat li wildlife live, nest in, migrate through, and seek protection from. Birds, as we know, do not know the difference between the sky and a building's reflection of it. It is no longer, it will be no longer a bird and wildlife sanctuary or a place bird watchers or esteemed photographers, not a quiet place for residents who seek out a slice of nature or much needed peace of mind. Instead, it will be a five story, 500 internal parking space construct apartment lake. The damage will be irreversible and without a buffer, it will set a dangerous precedent. Please help us city council your neighbors, Lakewood residents, everyone who loves Belmar Park, including its vast wildlife comprised of 230 species of birds, migrating pelicans, great herons, owls, geese, that fly from all directions here at dusk, and a plethora of wildlife. Please help it remain the gem of Lakewood. Thank you. Tom Durth. Is he still here? Yeah, he's pooled though. I was gonna have the pooling go last. Oh, okay. I don't that's the end of my list, Mayor. Okay. So you want to Good evening, Mr. Minutes. Mayor and Council. Thank you. And uh, in in honor of the folks that had to leave early, I would like to just share some ideas of um, this is my third time speaking here in about six weeks. And the first time I was here, I talked about safety. I talked about what if there's a fire that came across the park. And if you're out there right now, you see that all that high growth is drying up. And one little cigarette could, could kill many, many people. It turns out that all the people in, in the Belmar Commons and the people living in that building, and I think I mentioned last time that I was told at a council meet or at a uh, planning meeting one time that it's not a big problem because the new building was going to have a sprinkler system. And that's not going to help when we've got the cars for coming from our uh, community and the communities around, the restaurant, the, uh, um, the library, and from any other events that might be going on there. Plus, we're figuring that, you know, they're talking about maybe 500 cars. There's going to be 414 apartments there. You know full well to be able to afford those apartments, there's going to have to be a, probably two people at least living in each of those, and probably they all have two cars. That's about 800 cars that need to go out onto Yarrow Street, and Yarrow Street cannot handle that. It would look like La uh, Lahaina if there was a fire. That's basically what would happen. So my curiosity is, with all of that talk about emergency, did anybody hear that? Did anybody really hear that and take that into your heart and think about how many people could die because there's 800 more cars on that street? That's scary. That's really scary. Second time I came to talk, we talked about parking. The idea that Yarrow Street could not handle the cars. You say, well, they're gonna provide parking. Yeah, paid parking. And the people living in there, I, I, once again, I went down to um, what used to be Lucky's a grocery store in Wadsworth. Lots of cars in that parking lot. There are a lot, there's no park, there's no building, there's nothing going on in that building. But there's a big apartment building right next door that people say, why should we go up all these ramps to our parking places? And why should we pay for parking? There's parking out here. Same attitude's gonna happen. If they're paying that much for rent, why would they pay for parking? So they're gonna park on Yarrow. There is no room. You cannot park in any of the other lots around. And if the Yarrow is filled, you saw, for those of you who were here at the last meeting, you saw the pictures that I took 
from cider days where there's parking on both sides of the streets and there was a bus coming down there was a shuttle bus there was no way for anybody to get around that there were even two people on motor on uh, bicycles trying to get around that and it was really dangerous for them to go around that if you've got parking on both sides because it's minimal parking to begin with and you've got ups prime fedex garbage trucks, all those going down the street, you, they cannot pass one another. What happens now if we need an emergency vehicle in there, a fire truck, an ambulance, you name it, there's no room for them to get through. Did anybody hear that? Did anybody listen to that and think about the fact that cars cannot get through there. We were also told at that meeting, well, maybe we'll have to have parking permits. That means for the people in our community who have to, trucks or cars because of their business, we'll have to now pay to park on Yarrow Street. That's ridiculous. Did anybody hear that? And now we've got the trees coming down. Lots of people here talking about the birds, the trees, the animals. Is anybody listening? You have to listen to hear it. I can't speak for the birds. So I'm going to let the birds speak for themselves. Jay? I'd like everybody in the room to take a nice, deep breath. <laughs> We're not going to look at finance. Please, please. I'm building here. I'm building here. <laughs> take a deep breath. Sit down quietly in your chair and just watch this video. Let them speak for themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, those are the trees that are coming down if you let it. Are you listening? That's all I want to know. Are you listening? Because you have to listen to hear that. Let the birds speak for themselves. And thank you for the opportunity to share this thought with you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anybody else in chambers? Okay. We're going to go ahead and go online. When I, oh, come on down. Anybody else in chambers after Natalie? Okay. Thank you. I'm going to go off topic and just jump back to uh, Natalie meant in Ward 5. Um, I'm going to jump back real quick to the property tax issue because there's a couple of things we should just know tonight. Um, based off the calculations of what was passed of a 4.28 mil. And there was discussion that was revenue neutral. But actually, it appears to be that calculation will generate about nearly 12% increase in property tax revenue over the prior year. How is that revenue neutral? I'm looking at you, Councilor Strom. If you can tell me how that is, how is an 11 three quarter, 11 and three quarter percent interest increase revenue neutral when we talk about housing affordability because that can that discussion is not going away how is nearly a 12 percent property tax increase revenue neutral and how does somebody on a fixed income with an increase of three four percent maybe maybe increase in revenue 
keep up with nearly a 12% increase. It's not revenue neutral. It also violates the charter. City staff's given two answers on whether Lakewood 2D, an ordinance, an ordinance, overwrote our city charter. I'd like an answer. Because in the questions that the answer before is no. It, it didn't. So is that what citizens gave away? Uh, that conversation's not ending, so I'm kind of glad that I'm kind of glad the change up lineup and the agenda did occur. But I would hope I could get an answer maybe under um, council reports tonight, because if somebody's going to propose a motion, they should know what the percent of increase is. So I'm hoping that can be answered and we can get it on the record. But I don't think it's fair. People are, are house rich and not income rich, and what we passed tonight is. Well, it's half of what was horribly going to come to us. It's not nearly, nearly the consideration the council should have given. Not nearly. Councilor Jansen, thank you so much for trying to get a, a proper mill no reduction done tonight. I think you made great strides. Thank you for your service. Okay, anybody else in chambers? So we'll go ahead and go online. And again, when you're at 30 seconds, you'll hear that. When your time is up, you'll hear it twice. When you get brought in, please give us your name and ward or name and address. Like Mr. Holman. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Brian Holman. I've lived in Ward 2 for six years. Uh, I would have loved to be here in person, but it's not really safe for me to do so by bike from Two Creeks with the drivers today, especially at this hour. So thank you for hosting this online and letting me speak remotely. Also, thank you for staying up so late to listen to what I have to say. Uh, regarding the development near Belmar, as far as I'm aware, uh, this is not on Lakewood Parkland. This is on private property. And as far as trees go, we agreed as a community that a developer can replace the trees or pay a fee. Uh, if we want this to change, then we should change the liquid policy on that. If laws are being broken regarding this development, then clearly that's a legal matter that should be enforced. And as far as bird sanctuaries go and eco ecosystems go, uh, we have developed so much more sprawl, destroying ecosystems of various birds and other wildlife in order to build single family homes, subdivisions, manicured lawns, and destroy the natural ecosystem as part of the process. If we truly care about the climate and the environment, we should be building where people want to spend time and reduce the amount of land dedicated to travel infrastructure, including roads and the vast amount of parking lots. This development is honestly better than most of our existing housing developments. Studies have been conducted that show that roads and parking lots are extremely detrimental to bird habitats with the noise and pollution they produce. If anything, we need to congregate development into our downtown areas so that people don't have to drive over and build over prairies of the past. We are in a housing affordability crisis, and if we block any developments to build dwelling units near destinations where people can walk and bike to where they want to go, then we are only worsening the issue. If we prevent construction in areas that are near urban amenities, but allow homes to be built on greenfield space, it seems like we're doing the opposite of what we want. People are going to move here regardless. Where do we want them to be? Do we want them in the downtown and urban areas where shopping, entertainment, and employment exist? or in the open prairies and grasslands that once existed. We should be taking advantage of where people want to spend time and let them live close to those places. Also, those bridge lights were pretty dope and I missed them. Thank you, City Council. Thank you. All right. Cab? Can you give us your name and address or name and ward? You're free to go. The caller is KAB. You have to unmute star six. Keb? 
going once, going twice, KAB, unmute, star six. Okay, go to the next, please. All right, caller 3368. If you give us your name and address or name and ward, we'll get you started. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yep, we got you. Oh, fantastic, yay. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Bobby Wolf. I live in Ward 5, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be able to call in and watch uh, virtually from home tonight. Um, when I first learned of this project, like many of my fellow community members, I was disappointed. I went down a frenzy of going through all the different avenues online to try to understand this more. I love Belmar Park. I, like I said, I live in Ward 5, and I do long walks with my dog, and I enjoy biking around Belmar. I've lived here for only a little over a year now. But as I've done more research, with a big kudos to the City of Lakewood FAQ site, I understand this housing development is on private land. I question how we can save as many trees as possible. And I have questions on the parking lot. This is where more discussion between council and community needs to exist. I am for housing. There is language calling this luxury housing. And to my understanding, there's no rule on how a marketing term like luxury can be used in development. I'm curious how these developers might work with local economic developers and workforce and the role this council can support with those connections to encourage affordability for a portion of units. And in closing, I just wanted to say that there is an obvious generational divide in the public comments tonight and what I've been hearing in rhetoric from the community members. And I just really wanted to reemphasize a statement from, a, I believe his name was Cody previously, where he mentioned that we should be building where people want to spend their time. Thank you. Thank you. Looks like caller 5627, you're in the meeting. If you give us your name and address or name and ward. You are unmuted and ready to go. Uh, hello, I'm Lynn Judson from um, 1805 South Van Gordon Street in Lakewood, Ward 4. Um, and I wanted to, do you, do you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you so much for listening. I know it's late. Um, I, I think the testimony has been excellent tonight. Um, I wanted to just mention a few points that I thought were important. Um, as far as the development, the more that we put asphalt on grass, the more that we create parking lots, the more we absorb heat and we do the opposite of Lakewood's mission, which is to, um, is sustainability. I think it, this project does not seem to comply with our sustainability mission because I, I read something very alarming. It is that asphalt uh, absorbs more than about 95% of radiant heat from the sun and keeps it there and then discharges it all night. So basically, we're just heating up Lakewood. Also, with um, I estimate something like 800 to 1,000 new cars, and we other speakers have talked about the lack of access of emergency people to um, the new air area being built. But in addition, think of the carbon dioxide that's being released um, in auto emissions. Um, those are a couple things to consider and. I think we all want to attract quality people to Lakewood, and I think that it's been well expressed that this is a unique park and has um, very unique wildlife, and we want to um, maintain that and keep that, and I hope that we can. Thank you for listening. Thank you. All right, looks like caller. 9514, if you unmute, give us your name and address or name and ward, we'll get you started. You can unmute by hitting star six. Good evening, everyone. Hi. My name's Liz Miller, Ward 5. I am so proud of the, city, the citizens of Lakewood. 
you came out in full force, but you're being ignored. You'll always be ignored. We, you were ignored when we had the property taxes. Even $25 would help a lot for a lot of people, especially the senior citizens. It's just a shame that no one listens. You come out here and plead and cry almost for the Belmar Park, and you're being ignored again. They've already made their minds up. We know that. I want to thank Jensen. Honey, you were wonderful. You are for fighting for your citizens. You're listening to, for, to your citizens. Oliver, thank you. Um, there was one other one. Oh, um, Anita, I didn't want to forget you. Rebecca, so much. Uh, no, no, Regina. Regina, my goodness, what a woman. You are a fighter. Lenora, everyone out there, I wish you would listen to your citizens and not ignore them. You ignored him twice tonight. You've ignored him all, all the time I've listened to the meetings. I'm just embarrassed on how the citizens are being ignored. Good night. Good night. Thank you. All right. 2842. Get you in here. If anybody else online wishes to speak, star nine to raise your hand. You are unmuted. Give us your Hi, name and my address. My name is Jacob, and I'm in, I live in Ward 5. Great. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I live about a mile south of Belmar Park. I just wanted to provide a counterpoint to all the other commenters that were talking about the 777 Yarrow development. Um, first of all, there seems to be a large generational divide on this issue. All the people that have spoken against the issue thus far are significantly older in age and have owned their homes for many years. So they may not be aware of how acute the housing crisis is in the Denver metro area, of which Lakewood is a part of. Um, it also seems highly hypocritical to me for the city council to approve a mill levy decrease to protect this older generation's housing while at the same time blocking housing development. At the end of the day, there's simply not enough housing supply of homes to make housing affordable for younger generations. And the only way out of a housing crisis is to build more housing. I also find many of the prior comments to be disingenuous as if as the development does not occur within Belmar Park. And said this development is to demolish outdated vacant office buildings and place those with the apartments. These are not located within Belmar Park. These are the ugly apartments located in, or the ugly office buildings located next to Belmar Park. A commenter mentioned that these would be an eyesore. These vacant offices are already an eyesore. Another commenter mentioned environmental impact. High density housing near a walkable downtown area such as Belmar is the most environmentally friendly thing that can be built. The trees that are core to this issue do not reside within Belmar Park and they are not and they are all part of the office complex. These apartments do not impact the wetlands, habitats, or trees contained within the park. The aforementioned birds do not reside within the trees located within the currently existing office complex and it is disingenuous to incest to suggest that they do. All that being said, the proposed parking lot that does impact Belmar Mark should be subject to strict scrutiny for all the reasons that were previously mentioned. This is a convenient, there is a convenient underpass that connects to a large amount of parking on the other side of Wadsworth that can be used for event parking and is perfectly suitable for this purpose. I would strongly recommend not, not following through with the parking development, but following through with the apartments. Thank you for your time. Great. Thank you. Anybody else online? Okay. We'll go ahead and close public comment at 11.10 p.m. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, just actually just write your name down uh, in this space here. Anybody else in chambers? I have closed public comment, so anybody else, please step up. That's okay. You can use this pen too. Terry, do you want No, sorry. One bite at the apple. Okay. Hello, everyone. The um, last gentleman that spoke on on the telephone prompted me to come down here. I disagree that it's a generational divide. My young children, um, who are parents, are at home right now because it's a school night tomorrow. They can't come down here and sit till midnight to tell you how they feel. And a lot of the younger generation, including grandchildren, we heard a school teacher here, it's not convenient for them to come down here. So to say that it's a generational divide is absolutely, positively 
false. And if we need to bring down a bunch of teenagers for you to hear from, or a bunch of six-year-olds for you to hear from that come over to the school, we could probably do that. But it's not generational. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, 11-11, public comment is now closed. So we will go into the general business section of the meeting and I'll turn it over to Councillor Springsteen. Wow. <laughs> Thank you all for being here so much. Um, I'm mortified by how you've been treated tonight that I couldn't even get a vote through to allow you to make public comment at the beginning of the meeting because what would have been the harm in that? And a lot of people ended up going home, uh, which is part of their, their playbook, you see. I've been on council for four years, so I know the playbook really well, how to shake off the public, how to make you feel unimportant, how to make you go away and think you can't do anything about any of the things going on in the city. And that's why I proposed uh, this motion tonight. Um, you know, there were some very wise people who set aside land for the national parks in this country years ago. And I see this as that type of thing. Um, there's not much land left to do things like that with. Uh, a lot of you were out front of the building protesting tonight. A lot of you came to uh, the community meeting that we held last Tuesday to talk about ideas about how do we, how do we fight what seems the unfightable. And then tonight, <laughs> when the mayor told you not to clap and that he would have police escort you out of this room in a thinly veiled threat to people who are trying to make their voice heard, that, that flabbergasts me. You should not accept that. Um, to intimidate the public and violate their First Amendment rights to be here and speak and to clap, for goodness sake. I mean, you're not interrupting. And they want to talk about decorum. They'll, they're all up here making comments about every single thing I say. That's not decorum. Um, you're last on, uh, oh, I wanted to talk about the letter that was sent out by the developer this past week. And that's part of the playbook, too. Get you off your game, make empty promises. It was carefully planned that it would be two months. Where does that get us to? December 20th, what are we all doing on December 20th? Are we here in council chambers till 1114 on December 21st? I don't think so. That's part of the playbook. Um, so, a lot of people wanted a lot more than what I've proposed. They want the city to buy the land or they want the city to swap the land for other city land or they want um, this project to just stop altogether. So it was difficult for me to come up with sort of how, how do we accomplish part of what we need to without going too far um, going to the extent that possibly we could get a vote for this tonight. And um, what, I, what I came up with was, 
and by the way, I, I did just want to mention about that letter from the developer. The amount of hubris that it takes for, uh, for Wendy Strom and Rebecca Stewart to take credit for a halt, wow. Because like people said tonight, and what I have told all of you, is you did it. You organized, you spoke up, you chained yourself to a tree at Cider Days, you got the press involved. It is the citizens who have the power in this circumstance and deserve the credit. And, um, and that letter was a big nothing burger, like I said. Um, we need to pass something tonight for some kind of protection of this land. And so I looked into um, the Fee and Lou situation. And that was, uh, that was an ordinance that goes back many years in the city of Lakewood. I went back and looked at when that ordinance was passed or actually revised in 2018. You know who used to decide uh, whether we were going to allow a developer to buy their way out of park dedication? City Council used to decide that. But in 2018, somebody, oh, this is part of the playbook. We're going to get a red line version. We're going to cross out all the good language in the ordinance that protects the public. And so what we ended up with was somehow um, that it was going to be the duty of the director of community resources now to make a decision for almost 200,000 people about whether we were going to allow a developer to buy their way out of park dedication and open space. Does that seem democratic to you? So that's one of my questions. How the heck did that happen? Uh, but, you know, one of the things we ended up with in that resolution that was good was that we said we were going to, under 1416 100, review this ordinance. This chapter shall be reviewed by city council every five years, beginning five years after the effective date of the ordinance. The ordinance was passed on June 16, 2018. So what does that mean? We are several months past the required review of this ordinance. So what does that mean for the ordinance? I would venture to say that the ordinance is null and void with regard to the director of community resources being the person to make this decision. We're, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. OK, we're not going to do it, please. The other thing that was very bothersome to me, because I, I'm an attorney, and I was just helping somebody with their property tax appeal in Denver. They have maybe a quarter of an acre of land there, maybe less. And property tax valuation for land alone came back at $1.6 Guess how much we're letting the developer buy out each acre in this circumstance? You're going to be surprised. $254,000 per acre. We have 3.3 acres that they have to dedicate. They get to buy it out at a steal. 
Where did that number come from? I'm not quite sure. I don't see it in, in the new ordinance, but I'm pretty sure that that's why this was supposed to be reviewed yearly and at least at five years, because for the rest of us, our property taxes have increased how much over the last five years? We've talked a lot about that tonight and the mill levy and the things we're expected to pay for. But we, we have corporate welfare going on in this city. There, um, there's actually a statute, CRS 2468-102.5, that allows the local government to adopt a new or amended law or regulation when necessary for the immediate preservation of public health and safety. And we may enforce such a law or regulation into, in relation to applications pending at the time such law or regulation is adopted. We've had a physician who lives in this neighborhood uh, who's also the HOA board president, say that the increase in traffic on South Euro is inevitably increasing the risk of injury or death to our residents. But it's not just that. We have, we have a professor here tonight to speak to um, the effect this is going to have on the wildlife. An expert, an expert in the number of species of birds that come to this area. And I don't care what anybody says, a five-story building is going to interfere with that, especially, especially when birds are flying into buildings. And I've seen that happen many, many times. I wonder if he knows Paul Johnsgard from uh, Nebraska. Uh, who was a close friend of mine and an orthonologist there. And I took him to Belmar Park. And he said similar things. It was a, a very unique piece of land. And that's why May Bond fees wanted it protected. Um, so my thought on this fee in lieu, and I, you know, staff and other counselors are going to tell you. Well, she's trying to create a new ordinance. She's trying to amend an ordinance. She's trying to do all these things that you're not allowed to do. No, I'm, I am trying to say that we as a council have the ability to step in when there is a, an abuse of discretion by staff. So let me give you an example. If a staff member say, if we found out that they were accepting bribes from a developer, for instance, to allow a fee in lieu, would we not be able to step in and exert our fiduciary duty and say, we are going to direct the city manager to direct the director of community resources that we want them to not take that fee in lieu because they are abusing their discretion. Now, is it not an abuse of discretion to take less, far, far less than the land is worth? Is it? Is it not an abuse of discretion uh, to allow a fee in lieu every single time? I have a list here. Every single project on my list says we accepted a fee in lieu of land dedication. Is that somebody using their discretion? Or is that a giveaway? And here's the other thing. They are supposed to do things in the public interest under this ordinance. So if this is not something in the public interest, 
and that is not being considered, is that not an abuse of discretion? So what I'm asking for is for this council to step in and say, hey, staff, even if the ordinance says you make a certain decision, we have the ability to oversee you and, and create accountability and make sure that you are serving the public interest and the interest of the environment and the interest of sustainability and the interest of wildlife and the interest of mental health. We have the ability, we are your elected officials to protect you. And that is what I'm asking this council to do, to protect you, to hear you. Now we're right before an election, you know, it's my last night on council. It's Mary Jansen's last night on council. I am really hopeful to give the community something big tonight that will protect you in my absence. And I'm really hopeful that the people on this dais will back me up on this. Now the other things I asked for in this motion had to do with those 69 trees. And so if we don't accept the fee in lieu, if we require the park dedication in the open space, I think that that developer can work around those 69 trees. And so the, one of the other things I've asked for is that we direct staff to have that be part of this site plan as well as providing at least two parking spaces. And some of the things I took right out of our charter, right out of our policies, which is that the development is required to protect and enhance the natural environment and seamlessly integrate with the neighborhood. I mean, we're required to do that. I'm not asking to change something. That's something under our charter already. Um, so, one other thing I wanted to mention is that there's something um, that's permitted in Denver under the Urban Renewal Authority um, there, or something they put on their website. And thank you, Kathy Kentner, for, for pointing this out to me. Um, the, ability, the ability to acquire uh, private property through eminent domain or condemnation um, when that urban renewal area is blighted and it can be used for a public purpose. That is something we could consider here as well, is eminent domain. And so I encourage the council after me and after this motion tonight to look for other alternatives that make this better and better for the community. Um, So I guess at this point, I would read the motion into the record. Um, I make a motion that before a site plan is approved, the city manager is directed by city council to direct the director of community resources to require that the developer, Kyroi Properties, LLC or any subsequent owner provide open space and park dedication instead of a fee in lieu with respect to the development of Belmar Park West located at 777 South Yarrow Street, Lakewood, Colorado 80226. That the developer will be required to work around the 69 mature trees and not cut them down. That the developer will be required to provide at least two parking spots for every unit built. That the development will be required to protect and enhance the natural environment and seamlessly integrate with the neighborhood, which 
will require input from neighbors and citizens, neighborhood meetings, and input from wildlife experts. If it is determined by city council that this has not been accomplished, the site plan will not be approved. And I, I just wanted to mention as well, somebody had brought up that it's also um, in our charter that we have to protect trees that are mature in, in development plans. So again, I'm trying to keep with what our existing laws are, but create some guardrails to how this development's gonna go down. So thank you so much to all of you and all of your efforts. People printing flyers with their own money. People, um, you know, just showing up and doing all these things. And it, it is not a generational issue. Um, I've been taking my kids to that park since they were babies. Um, and all of those generations want this park preserved as well. Councilor Magarero. Was that an official motion? Because if so, I, I was going to speak to the motion. But if not, I can wait until my well, turn on the general. Yeah, request. I was waiting for discussion. Um, second, yeah. by the way. Well, if that's so, a motion, I'll second. Just hold on, Councilor. Magra has the floor, but I'm just going to remind the group, and the group is going to have to figure this out. So as per our policies and procedures, when you do a request for council action, this is a resolution. There are a few issues with this, but we can get into the legal. But you bring this forward for consensus of the body to then move to a formal review and a vote that's posted. So. I'm going to tread lightly. I know there's a lot of community interest, but these are our policies. These are the policies that this council has had to follow since Councillor Franks and Councillor Abel rewrote our policies and procedures. So I need to make sure that this council knows that and that any direct vote tonight would be in violation of our own rules because much like Councillor Jansen did a few weeks ago, she put hers forward and then it was consensus to go on to tonight. We had amendments that were voted on. Councilor Magarero, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I am sure that some of the things that I have to say, I'll get to circle back to at some point, and I'll try to keep it really to the point of this motion. Um, and to say, first of all, I'm very impressed with all of your tenacity and persistence in being here at this late hour. It's incredible. It's really, really incredible. I, my day job is that I work and I run a community organizing team. So I recognize how much work it is to get this many humans here and that's amazing. I also worked for almost 10 years in the conservation movement specifically on environmental justice issues and growth and housing was one of my uh, main portfolio areas of expertise. And so I do think that the idea of having additional discussion, accountability, and improved planning around such a sensitive area that borders such an important park is very necessary. And I do wonder if, given that a resolution is in part really designed not to change our actual code and ordinance, but to signal like where we are as a city council, there are aspects of this that I do not align with, but there are aspects of it that I do align with. And so I think I'm happy to have the conversation. I recognize that uh, that, that may, might not be where it happens, and I'm not sure if Councillor Springston and I would align on what my proposed amendments would be. Um, but I do think that the idea of reducing the impact to the grown trees is really critical and also ensuring that any tree that does end up being taken out um, is replaced by 1.5 trees rather than one, I think is also sometimes a creative solution we've seen other places. I also want to recognize that, again, it is on private property. And I know that that is being, the narrative on that is like, oh, that's us wringing our hands or that's us using excuses. But I really genuinely want to ask you all, 
do you want to live in an America where your property can be taken by imminent domain by a city council? It is. All right. All right. I, it's all right. Apologies. All right. Okay. All right. Stop. Apologies. Apologies for riling okay. everybody up. Uh, stop. I genuinely think that the idea of using eminent domain on this particular piece of property that has been owned by this particular group for so long would be very irresponsible in terms of the way that eminent domain is traditionally used both in this city and most of the time in America. And I would love to continue to have that conversation offline if people especially have expertise in eminent domain. Um, <clears throat> I also do want to recognize that the vast majority of Colorado is in fact in a migratory bird path. Um, and we have taller buildings still. One of the things that was brought up is perhaps a building like this belongs along West Colfax and in Ward 2 and not where this park is. And the people of Ward 2 also need access to nature. And so the more infill that we've had in those spaces has reduced our ability to build green space and preservation for the natural habitat and for the human's mental health that also live there, which are equally valued members of our community. The point around climate change also in um, densification is always really fascinating because yes, does the carbon impact of that specific block change? Absolutely. But the sprawl that we end up seeing into the foothills in this part, not just of Lakewood, but in this part of the world, right? All of Colorado has this issue where we're building further and further into the mountains. And that amount of, first of all, the houses themselves have much larger carbon impacts than an apartment, which means that the individuals, the per person in their lifetime has a larger carbon input or impact, excuse me. So with density in particular, what you see is that the per person carbon impact, because these are humans that exist, that live, not building this building does not prevent them from living, right? They still exist. They're still breathing and driving and buying things. And that is a carbon impact of that person's life, right? We all have a carbon footprint. And when you put a person in a dense, walkable, park adjacent part of a city, you reduce the per person carbon footprint for their lives. And I know that that's like a lot of thinking and like math to work around, but that is in part why I am in generally in favor of more density where appropriate. And now how, how appropriate this level of density is there, I think is a great point of concern. But the idea that no apartments belong there is not something that I'm really aligned with. But again, the idea, some people said it, there was a range, right? You're not a monolith. Some people said they didn't want anything. Some people said they were willing to negotiate on stuff. Some people said having the developers come to the table is good. Some people said it wasn't, right? Because we don't, we get to speak with many voices. That's the point of democracy. All right, Lenore, please. And so to the motion, I would say that I'm very willing to have the conversation around passing a resolution in regards to this property. I would want it to specifically speak to um, the continued public engagement with the actual developers. I would also want to change the language about trees. And I would also say that given that parking is again, something that is very important to this issue, but is also something that having large amounts of parking, again, increases the carbon impact of a total project, changes the amount of heat sequestration, changes the total amount of cars, is actually also not something that I want to mandate at this site without a lot more study. So those are my concerns about the specific resolution. Thank you. So I have Councillor Franks. Thanks, Mayor. Um, is it more appropriate, I mean, I guess if we're getting ready to tee this up for a vote, is it also appropriate to kind of share just overall general thoughts? Okay, just wanted to be sure I was in line. Um, first, I just want to acknowledge how much we all love our parks. Belmar is absolutely a crown jewel. Um, many of you may not know me, but my uh, history of coming to council is because of open space. Um, 
Forsberg Park is there because of one woman's mission and a lot of us who stood behind her. So you have Forsberg Park thanks to that dedicated work. Um, Hutchinson Park, um, that predates right before I joined on council. Um, probably 2,000 hours of my time, several years, and it ultimately led me on to council. Um, campaigning for Crown Hill and making sure that it stayed passive. And then fighting for when, the, when we wanted to put on the ballot for uh, the Tabor timeout, fighting tooth and nail to ensure as many dollars that, as we could possibly get for open space. So I just really wanted folks to know that, that certainly it is something that I am highly passionate about. And uh, my husband can tell you that um, I disappeared for two and a half years to invest in a very lengthy battle that won that uh, situation. And if anybody would like the outcome of that, I'd be happy to send you the judge's ruling on that, uh, Judge uh, Margie Enquist. So I just wanted to lay some foundation there. Um, I also wanted to make sure that um, the community is aware that uh, several of us, when we joined on council, we did work very hard on a council's policies and procedures. It used to be uh, that there was discretion for uh, you know council members, I mean, I mean the public, to come and speak, and we embodied that into the council's policies and procedures, guaranteeing the pooling of time and that information. So that was because we absolutely did want to hear from the public and make sure everyone was heard. Um, now speaking, kind of changing gears and wanting to switch to the the, the uh, motion itself, want to talk through the fact that we do have, and it's been in place for quite some time, a very orderly way of bringing forth um, council requests for action. There are some things that council may want to bring forward that are a minor modification. And there's other things that touch upon other laws and you have to have, go through very extensive legal review to ensure that at least you're factoring in all of those things for consideration. And so the uh, guaranteed speaking time was Councilor Abel and I, and then uh, Councilor Skilling, who's no longer on council, we were very focused on making sure that there was a, a, a process that we could go through that would be orderly, it could be noticed out to the public, and things weren't just you know, appearing um, you know, during the uh, council reports. So again, very orderly process here. Um, my inquiry I, I would like to, to understand is, it is my understanding that this, uh, you know, did not go through legal review before it went into our packet, but I do believe there has been at least some, some investigation into that, and I think that's important. Um, so I'd like to pause there before I w finish with my comments and make sure that we're sort of all aligned on that there has been at least an analysis of what's in the packet. Certainly we can propose other things, but can we, can we get that uh, feedback? Yes. So are you asking for an analysis of, okay. So in reading through this, the only way it can really be read as anything that's potentially uh, compliant with existing Lakewood Municipal Code, existing policies, existing charter, is to read it as an attempt to amend the Municipal Code going forward. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, uh, this is a resolution. And as you all know, you cannot amend an ordinance with a resolution, you have to amend it with an ordinance and go through that whole ordinance process. Now, the reason I have to read it that way is that otherwise this is ordering staff through the city manager to violate our existing ordinances, which would be illegal and directly contrary to our charter, state and federal law. The other um, aspect I want to explore is um, how CRS 2468-102.5, um, what that provides by the state. Well, that allows for emergency ordinances in emergent situations. Could you give me an example ups for the public for a, an emergency situation? Sure. Um, if you remember last winter, uh, when we were enc encountering all these really extreme climate events, extreme cold, there are emergency ordinances to allow for housing of unhoused people or shelters overnight. And the idea was to change the municipal code as soon as possible to allow that because if you had to go through the ordinance process, it would take a month or two and by that time, you'd have a lot potential loss of life 
and it wouldn't be as pertinent anymore because the climate would change. Okay. So then what I'd like to read is um, I had sent out to a lot of folks uh, who had reached out to us, many via email. I want to read the five bullet points um, that I put in that email. I just want to test those, make sure that there's not something I put in there that was incorrect that needs to be corrected in, in, in this public uh, forum. And I'll read all five of them, then you can comment about those. Um, again, this is something you just said earlier, but resolutions cannot be used to amend ordinances. Changes to an ordinance must be done via an ordinance which requires noticing and a public hearing. By charter, state and federal law, city staff and council must adhere to ordinances in order to be in compliance with the law. But council can choose at any time to amend or create new ordinances or our city charter also allows for citizen initiated ord ordinances and amendments to ordinances cannot be retroactive. I just want to make sure if anything there is even on the bubble, I want to make sure that we discuss that if, it, if any of that's not correct. No, that, that's absolutely correct. Okay. Um, in addition, uh, we have had reference tonight to um, a 17.658. Um, our ordinance, the existing tree preservation. And I, what I want to call attention to there is the, I think there's some confusion about sort of that analysis process. And I know I looked at all of the site plans and some trees obviously not in the 69 count were looked at maybe by an arborist and determined to be dead, um, you know, those types of things. Um, but it does say what's feasible and I think, would that be then in, in, if we were moving things forward, we would need to also make sure that things were feasible, that we weren't in, you know, putting intentional roadblocks. I mean, if there's a tree in the middle of a thing, which obviously there isn't at this point, I want to understand that ordinance, sort of what discretion, because it also then in the second section provides for if you are taking out a tree, and again, I took out three of my own trees and cried every time my husband can tell you. Um, but I want to understand sort of we have a provision that talks about existing trees, then certain ones will be protected, but in the event that it is not feasible, then there's a provision for basically building back up the canopy. And I just want to understand sort of that ordinance a little bit better, that piece. Yes, as you stated, the existing um, Lake Municipal Code Zoning Ordinance 17659 calls for a number of different potentials for tree replacement, including replacing tree, uh, the same amount of caliper, in other words, like the trunk circumference of trees. So you might take out five trees and replace them with 10 or something along those lines. But most pertinently under provision C, if a property owner chooses not to replace, I'm reading directly, the total caliper of trees on site, the owner may make a cash payment of $1,200 per tree into a tree fund. That is our existing municipal code. What that means is that the developer or whoever owns has the discretion to make that decision. That's not a, that's not a staff discretion. Well, thank you. And, and that's really what I'm trying to illuminate for the public is there may be things in our existing ordinances that you look at and say, boy, that's, that's not what I envisioned for our city. That's not what I think we should have in there. Absolutely. I think those discussions need to happen. We need to look at those. But I, I just also want to be very clear that I asked the question multiple times, um, can we make some of these things retroactive to things that are already in the pipeline? And part of my job is to also ensure that I am acting in a fiduciary manner where I am not going to cause us legal harm. And again, we're balancing all those things. And I get the passion. Like I said, I was in the audience for 2090. And we packed the chambers. We multiple times had to have a hundred seats out in the uh, in the atrium area. So I absolutely know that what I'm trying to do is be as informed as I possibly can in order to make a determination, um, uh, you know, on, on what we would do tonight. Now, because in my mind, when we look at the pause, whether you believe the pause that the developer has proposed is genuine or not, it is a pause that they have put on, which then I can't support an emergency action for something that isn't an emergency. That doesn't mean we, no, we don't care and we're not going to take action, 
but it's not an emergency, meaning that there isn't this imminent thing that's going to happen, and if we don't act tonight, therefore, I do believe a full legal review. I think I am very, uh, you know, and again, I'm talking about things that I will have no impact on, because I will, tonight's my last night. Um, I am open to looking at our, you know, fee and lieu and how it's done, and um, but again, we'd have to also be given the advice of what can we do retroactively, if anything, and I'm being told, unless I can find additional information, for something that's already in motion to retroactively try to do that. Um, it causes legal peril. And so again, those are decisions that have to be made. These are, these are tough decisions. Um, and I think I've explored um, all the things that I wanted to explore. So thank you, appreciate the extra time. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Olver. Thank you. Um, so am I to understand that we are not going to vote on Anita's resolution tonight, Mayor? Well, our policies and procedures as such would not do that. It would be a consensus to move it forward or not or change. So we are going to vote on um, our opinions, let's see, to allow a motion to get the pulse of the council. So we, we, we can make motions, we just can't make the motion she, she brought forward? We can take a consensus to move exactly what is brought forward forward again. Because I have another motion that might cover it. everything, well, part of it. And it, here, here's what it is. Um, it is city council, my motion, I, I move, it is city council's wish that staff not allow a fee and lieu arrangement for the 777 South Yarrow development. And so with... So it's just a wish. And, and with that... It's actually taking the pulse of our council just to maybe help people feel a little better about council that we're actually going to do something. Right. Um, well, and, and so, so the reason why I ask or am engaging there is because when we did the the proclamation there was a proclamation that we did for save bear creek lake park that took into account based upon um uh what their leadership was doing what they wanted and what this body wanted to see we produced a proclamation that's on our website with katie gill um who, who heads it up right i was on here the, on so that's probably the more appropriate but you could get consensus for that I think it's a good thing to get at least a consensus so we'll, f we'll get at least a feel for what council thinks and we can actually debate a little bit more. I mean, it's, it's late, but uh, I think everybody that's here wants to stay a little longer and listen to what most of the people here want to say. And so that's something we could debate on right now. Okay. So I have some more lights on. Um, um, I would need a second probably. We're not quite to that that point on the consensus you know I mean? taking. So I have um, Councillor Charzai. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I appreciate Councillor Frank's uh, clarifying because I think for me what's hard is that there seems to be, um, we created uh, some space in this process, whether people believe this to be true or perceived, by uh, the pause with the developers. I'd also add that nothing there was no master plan that was finalized and it's my understanding as well that the 69 trees have already been reduced in further iterations. So I, I feel like these are um, arbitrary uh, sort of urgency right now, but I understand and appreciate all of you that have come out uh, over the last two meetings to share about this. Um, I guess for me, I'd, I'd wanna understand better the fees in lieu if we were at the five year look back and we did make some decisions, could we retroactively apply that to something that's in process? No, is the head shaking. Okay, that's helpful to understand. Um, you know, I, I'm open to some of these things in this resolution but are counter to the goals that we set as a council um, at the start of the year and year over year. You know, the parking thing would be a non-starter for me, um, but there are things that I'd be willing to talk about. It just feels like, the urgency is set because there's someone who's exiting council tonight and wants to see this pass through. And I feel like we want to have a really clear conversation right. with the community and be able to understand what is legally possible in this. You know, we're 
shoving this through very quickly and I, I just think that there's an opportunity for us to get more clarity. We've already learned tonight just through a couple of questions being answered that what's being proposed here isn't even possible. So I understand people's frustration and I'm committed and I know my peers are as well in finding a solution for this that um, helps to get us closer to where we need to be as a community. But I, I'm not sure that this resolution as it stands here is something that I could get behind. Okay. Councillor Vincent. Yes, thank you. Um, and I thank you for the clarifying questions. I, I think that a resolution does not change an ordinance. An ordinance can change an ordinance. People can bring forth an ordinance. And I know that's very um, um, irritating and confusing to people to understand. There's a, there's a lot in this that I like too. And if anybody on this council after eight years plus having to go through light rail and everything can understand eminent domain and I personally do not like fees in lieu of. Our ward has had more fees in lieu of and the least amount of parkland that's been dedicated to that than anybody. And as far as I'm concerned, it's been, it's been a stuff shot to our ward, okay? And we've had to give it up. Plus the the um, the apartments and everything that have been built there have caused a lot of consternation also because they think it's, it's come up against single family residents and a lot of it has. Now, I've also, I think, been the longest person here working with developers, however horrible that may sound. Um, but there are zoning requirements and there are things that developers are allowed to do. Um, although I don't talk about it a lot, I have worked with developers to have even reduced the floors that have been on there, to push back what's there, to offer more parkland and dedication that will be accessible to the public in there. I find that sometimes developers will do what they can as long as they hear from, from the community. And I think that you need to make those things very clear. We had a horrible problem and they learned when the, when the people got upset that they charged for parking. Well, hello, you, got, you guys said it right here. I'm not gonna pay another $100 a month to park my car. I'm gonna park it on the roadway. Those are the kind of things that I think you should look at and the amenities that you should look at. Try talking to them. I, I don't like this project. I, it goes from, from end to end. So try to work with them. It's only a two month pause and you can bring it back again. I mean, there's nothing that says you can't come back and speak if you don't get anything. And I know that that's irritating, but I have to say this now because because I know what can be done and I know how irritating it is to see things just scraped and a five-story building going up. So try to work with them. Um, I know that sounds ugly right now. And let's see what we can do to move it forward if there's something legally we can do or not. So that's, that's all I wanted to say, if we move it forward. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Strom. Thank you. <clears throat> a lot to say. Um, I want to start with being completely candid about there are several things about this project that are likewise frustrating to me. Um, it's big for the space. I too share concern about the trees and the birds and, and the traffic is a significant one in my mind as well. Um, and I'm sorry that this process has felt disingenuous to some as well as lack of transparency to others. Um, we've learned there, there are things that we can and should do better in the future, but to the point of the fact that we, we changing rules retroactively, none of us would like to have that happen to us either, um, if it was even realistic to occur. The developer, this piece of land is something that, love it or hate it, this is their land. 
we i am very enthusiastic about the fact that they were not required to come to public comment but they offered to make that concession they're going through a process that includes mediation and that's where it is incumbent upon us to make sure that our voices continue to be heard because we do collectively have things that we have concerns about and would like to see done better but unfortunately and I'm, I apologize to those of you that believe or have been told that this is an up or down vote from City Council. It is a property rights situation. I don't like 69 trees going away, but this is very much a property rights situation. And I do hope that the, the owner is showing up in good faith and planning to be that good neighbor that they say that they're planning to be. Councilor Stewart and I worked very hard with staff. Staff worked very hard to try to get this to happen. And I wanna make it clear to all of you, it did start with you. It did start with you. We couldn't have or wouldn't have worked as hard without hearing so many voices from each of you and consistently and I'm sorry that it didn't feel more public than it was before. It's just not, a, it's not, that, that's not digital infrastructure that we have in place or communicated infrastructure that we have in place, but it's something that we should talk about and we do need to do better. We need to do communication better. And I wanna say, I'm sorry that it felt like a surprise. Um, and I, I just, I can't communicate enough to you. There have been, accusations of lack of, of um, integrity and, and a number of other things tonight. But we are all up here, and I know you are all in the, in, in the audience tonight because you love this city. And this park, this project, directly puts at risk something that you likewise hold dear. And so I want to make a commitment to you, although we've talked through the fact that res resolutions cannot change ordinance and zoning code is an ordinance, that creates challenges and barriers tonight, but I'm not ready to give up. And I hope you guys aren't either. We need to continue this conversation. And I hope that you will trust that we up here, as we're sharing our comments with you, you are being heard. We've heard a lot of things from all of you, and we appreciate your consistency in coming back. And some of your very thoughtful emails and thoughtful asks that have really asked us to look at very specific things. So thank you very much for every one of you that have come tonight. And one, one takeaway that I have with this as well is I've heard from voters um, several times, more than several times, Zoning is where Lake, one thing Lakewood needs to really look at doing better. And I fundamentally believe that that is something that we do need to do better. And it is something that will partner very well as we move through the next iteration of our comp plan, our comprehensive plan. And we as a city decide where we want growth to be and where we don't want it to be. And we can utilize that as a springboard to actually addressing some of these zoning issues so that we do not have some of these challenges for, pro for projects that are coming down the pike. I wish we could retroactively change these things, but it's not feasible. And I think as Councillor Franks had mentioned, we are operating up here as fiduciaries of the city. And one big thing that is important for that role is that we need to make sure that we are protecting our city um, to the extent that we can and rely on legal counsel for doing this. We need to make sure that we're not putting ourselves in potential legal harm's way with every decision that we make. And that's a big important reason why this resolution needs to be vetted before we actually come up. And I would fully support the idea of a proclamation that says these similar things so that we are as a body collectively sending a message to the owner that we are, these are the things that we've heard from our residents and these are the things likewise that we would like you to consider as you're moving forward through the planning process. Councilor Jansen. Thank you. Um, it is kind of amazing when we have a charter and everybody says we need to follow the charter. And um, when we have something that happens where I'm following the charter, you guys don't follow the charter. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's the same thing over and over again. Um, one, 12, one, two, so it states, 
you can't go above the 7% in the revenue and you still, you know, you win above it. So you, you, you're you saying being fiduciary, I'm being the one that's being fiduciary and you guys are, at, are, are, are going against the charter. So now you're saying, now you're saying, oh, we have to follow the charter or we have to follow the rules and, and it's, it doesn't make any sense to me. So thanks. Councillor, Councillor Springsteen. So, on the last night at council two years ago, before the election, October 25th, 2021, Dave Skilling brought a motion out of the blue, hadn't written it down, hadn't publicly noticed it, nobody knew it was coming. In fact, the motion was so not thought out that he didn't even clarify what the motion was actually about other than to direct, count, uh, direct the staff to write a letter about me to the Independent Ethics Commission for the state and that was about the extent of the motion. It was very confusing. Uh, he was saying something about a conflict of interest, but didn't really specify what that was. Um, there was no pushback on the fact that he hadn't even written down this motion. It hadn't been publicly noticed. Uh, it hadn't been vetted. Uh, that he didn't even define what the motion actually was. Uh, my understanding was that after staff wrote this letter that was supposed to intimidate me because they were trying to say I had some kind of conflict of interest, that that should come back to council and council should approve it before it got sent out. Well, that's not what happened. Mayor Paul wrote the letter and sent it out himself without getting final approval of council. And guess what? Within half an hour, he had a response email from the Independent Ethics Commission saying, what are you doing? You can't do this. You're a local home rule place. You have your own rules. We don't have jurisdiction. Did he come back and tell us that he had an immediate response turning down this thing that he didn't even have a vote of counsel on? Nope. Six weeks later, we had to do, I think Councillor Abel did a core request and finally got the information that the IEC had not taken up this issue at all. So. You know, I mean, that was part of the harassment. I was supposed to sweat it out and worry about it for six weeks and whatever. Uh, but, you know, the point is, we passed a motion that night that nobody had even seen. And so um, I'm looking at the policies and procedures, procedure 5.9, and what I'm seeing is that you can make a motion. Any council member may make or second a motion to approve, amend, table, or continue any matter before the council. Motions and seconds shall be made in accordance with Robert's Rules of Order Parliamentary Procedure. Um, so what I'm saying is I've always been treated disparately, differently than other members of this council. If any of them were bringing this motion, we would be voting on it tonight. Now the city attorney is saying that he heard something 
about me trying to amend an ordinance. And I'm saying, no, I'm not trying to amend or change an ordinance. I am trying to uphold our fiduciary duty and step in and say there was an abuse of discretion and that we need to rectify that and that it's our duty to do so. And they're talking about we can't do this stuff retroactively. So, I mean, they're saying this is a done deal. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing they can do. They're not going to help you. Doesn't matter if it's two months from now. They're not going to help you. Um, the other thing is, you know, some of us, Mary, Rich, and I, have been told we can't even talk to staff, much less developers. So I want to know how Councillor Strom and Councillor um, Stewart we're having all these negotiations with developers when the rest of us aren't allowed to do that. How did that happen? Again, disparate treatment. I suspect it was actually the mayor who had that, those discussions, but that's speculation. Um, so you all should dig in to whether that that is truthful, that there were all these negotiations that went on. But, you know, um, private property. I mean, our whole purpose here is to tell people who are building how to build. Isn't that what we're here for? And uh, we're going to replace 1.5 trees. I mean, 1200 bucks a tree? Wow. I, 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 don't, I, I don't even know how you get a tiny tree for that amount of money. Um, this is not an emergency. So when that was said, then I understood the pause to make this so it wouldn't be an emergency. Right out of the playbook, <laughs> you know? It is an emergency because we're about to have a brand new council. We don't know how they're going to vote. We have three wards where nobody will even challenge the person stepping in to the seat. So what do you think that means? I mean, that means it's all, it's all, it's all been planned. Uh, legal peril. That's always the excuse. The developer might sue us. The developer might sue us. And what they know is that it's hard for the community to sue. It's not unprecedented. The community has sued. But they're more worried about the developer suing, always. That's always what you're going to hear from these people. That's fiduciary duty to just kowtow when somebody says they might sue? That's, that's your fiduciary duty? Um, you know, this is, this is not about changing the ordinance. It's about saying you can't abuse your discretion. You can't take $250,000 for an acre of land. And I mean, that's ridiculous. And all of this garbly gook you're hearing tonight is just that. Why can't they just stand up? All we need is six votes. And you know, this whole idea that, <laughs> that, that this is not following policies and procedures is just not accurate. It's not accurate. So if, if that is going to end up being the way we go. And it shouldn't be about consensus. There should be a motion and a vote tonight, not consensus. I, I don't even see where it says that in the policies and procedures. I have made a motion, and I'm going to appeal the decision of the chair if he decides that we cannot vote on this motion tonight. Thank you. Councilor Stewart. Well, I want to start off by saying that 
if we are looking for consensus, I am very interested in some sort of a proclamation if we're looking for consensus to move forward. I do think it's important as these um, stakeholding conversations with community move forward that the city council very clearly state um, where we're at with this project and what our desires would be. Um, I, I am, I'm gonna be honest, I'm a little bit frustrated. Um, we were asked to do something and, um, and so I, I did. And, um, you know, whether or not it feels like the right solution um, or something that's disingenuous, you know, I'm happy to, happy to talk about it. Um, definitely took a page out of Councillor Vincent's playbook as far as um, the concessions that she's been able to get from developers for her community. Uh, which I think is really impressive because a lot of areas in Ward 2 are inside of that Colfax Urban Renewal District and butt up against some of the same issues that we're facing with this project. Um, so, you know, I've been really impressed with the way that you have advocated for your community with developers. Um, and that was, you know, why I chose to participate in these discussions. I want to be very clear. I have never spoken to this developer. I have never met them. Um, I, you know, have had a lot of discussions with planning staff throughout the last year as I have organized stakeholder meetings with residents um, in the adjacent community with city staff to get their questions answered and their um, concerns out in the open. Um, my very first concern when this project was brought to me was traffic, like it is for a lot of us, so I asked for a traffic study. Um, the concerns about fire safety, um, West Metro is involved in all of these projects. If this was not, they already have put forward requirements with this project um, because of fire safety. Um, I am not a fire safety expert. I defer to West Metro. Uh, they are involved in every single piece of planning. So I would really encourage us to maybe um, you know, if we want to get additional clarification on what they determined about this project, I'd be really interested in hearing that, but that will come from West Metro. That's what their job is and in this, in this process. Um, again, just want to reiterate that we created space because I do think it's important that folks who want to come in and build housing in our community be good neighbors. And quite honestly, I am pretty interested in looking at ways to require community stakeholdering for these larger projects prior to them getting into this planning process, which is currently not a requirement. Um, again, they don't have to come down here and talk to anybody. It's important that they do, and that's why several of us on council um, chose to point at what was happening in the community because again, want to be very clear that this did, this public pressure came from you. This is the only reason we were able to get them to come to the table and agree to actually travel to Colorado and talk with anybody is because we were able to throw our weight around because of you. Look at, look at the groundswell of what's happening in the community you need to do better, you need to be a good neighbor. And honestly, I've been saying that for a year and um, nothing has happened. So I think it's pretty clear that this was because of you guys and you should be really proud um, because we got something that frankly, they had absolutely no obligation to do. And I think it's important that we take advantage of it. Um, I think one piece of taking advantage of it could be a proclamation by the city council. Um, you know, if that's really what we are trying to do here is talk about what the city council really wants for this community and what we want the developer to uh, play ball around, then I would be happy to be part of the consensus that moves that forward to start examining that. Um, 
again, just want to double check with our legal counsel. Is there any other way to read this proposed resolution other than a amendment to existing city code and ordinance? It could be read two ways. It could be read as an amendment or an attempted amendment to existing city code or a direct a direction to staff to violate existing city code. What would happen if we directed staff to violate city code? What would happen if we took that tack? That's not actually an easy question to answer because it's a question of whether city then city staff would have an obligation to still follow the municipal code or to follow the direction that city council has given them. City staff would be put in an almost impossible quandary. And then depending on whatever action city staff took, there may be legal ramifications of that based on the potential taking of a, pro of a protected property right of this developer. So at the very least, we need rigorous legal review and again, to actually use the proper channels to amend any ordinances if we wanted to. Absolutely. And if we amended these ordinances at this point in time, would any of them apply to the current project? No. Is there anything that we could do to make them apply to the current project? No. If we tried, what would happen? I'm not sure if I understand what you mean by try, but if any municipality violates its own municipal code in an effort to stop some sort of development, it's, it's all but automatic that we end up in court that way. Would we um, have strong legal standing to defend that decision? That's not a question that I feel comfortable on answering outside of an executive session. Okay, great, thanks. Okay. So, you know, I started the meeting off by saying we're all here because we care and we love our community. And that's certainly factual. And I think I stated this two weeks ago. I mean, this is important. What you're saying is important. Um, I, I'm at Belmar Park every Sunday morning. It's beautiful, right? I've lived in Lakewood 46 years my whole life. Um, parks and open space is what really makes Lakewood unique and I'm proud of the fact we've added 13 parks and over 200 acres <laughs> in the last eight years and that's because this community values that and so whenever you have these sort of tough conversations you really get where we're at tonight right and a lot of frustration and angst but I think everybody needs to realize we're all on the same side on this whether we see no we certainly are and but what we're given with is an imperfect solution in that we truly are trying to look at changing an ordinance via a resolution. And so do you go forward with something as the mayor of a community? And, and look, you're important. There's a lot of you here. There's 158,000 people in this community. And we have to try to balance that as we move forward. And when you go back on the fee and lieu, when it was changed in 2018, the real goal then, and this is a different time, a different era, different lens, was we changed it to make sure that you weren't able to buy your way out of large tracts of land, right? That was the concern at that time, was that we'd have developers buy their way out of large tracts. So it brought it down to smaller tracts. And it was mentioned earlier that we have taken a lot of fee in lieu, because when you look at the infill development, mainly in Ward 2, those dedication pieces are really small slivers. So those dollars are more impactful in an area like Ward 2 where they can go in and be pooled for the redevelopment of Two Creeks Park. Perfect system, no. Ebb and flow of change, absolutely. And so these are the conversations I think as we move forward at parkland dedication, at school dedication that need to be addressed. And when you do a heat map 500 feet within Belmar Park right now, there's 1,400 units of residential. And I would venture to guess we would struggle to put in a library today next to Belmar Park. There's a XL Energy substation within 500 feet of our beautiful park. People's whole backyard on the west side of Belmar Park is Belmar Park, right? There's a lot of people that are interacting. And I would stand here, I would welcome 500 units of affordable, all affordable, 100%. But I've also had that fight because every affordable project that we've had, we've had the same kind of turnout of people saying we don't want affordable. 
And so it's never black and white. And you heard from folks that are long time established residents to younger residents. And I think, again, we all want the same thing. And you have the opportunity, at least for now, with the developer and with smart, engaged people to come together and say, let's really look at these issues and see if we can make an inroads. And you haven't even given that, that chance yet, right? And I've been around a long time to know that not always do developers even take the time to say we're gonna come when they don't have to. And that is because of you, but it's also because people have worked hard behind the scenes. So you have very valid concerns. And I think through our mediation program and through your engagement, I think you could make some things happen. And there's been other examples in our community where that has happened. And so I would encourage this community to continue that as you move forward to take this opportunity. You have a complete pause. And we talk about urgency. I think they're still, I mean, they, their submittals, even without a pause, are months apart, right? I mean, they're not even that far into the process because they're still taking in comment from the planning department on what they need to do. And you heard earlier, they've already changed the tree number, right? So these things are continuing to happen. Complete pause, make sure that you are at the table with them. And I, I think that's the, the one of the best things that we can offer at this point. And then the other piece about the fee and lieu, there's an appraisal rate that is unique to government. I shouldn't say unique, but it's common. So when you are looking at a piece of land in downtown Denver, you probably are gonna get a lot more per acre. So you really have to make sure you're looking at apples to apples. And so I would make sure through this process that you are looking at those comps for a piece of land. And the other thing is we have neighbors right across the street that are really concerned about parking. So does the fee in lieu actually make sense for some parking or not? But those are things I think the most impacted community should be at the table to engage on. The owners of Iron Gate have let the city of Lakewood park in their parking lots for all of our events for 25 plus years. In fact, walking around the park on Sunday morning, people enjoying the park, where were they parking? They're parking on their property, right? And so it's gonna be important that if something like this were to happen, we still have another opportunity for parking to bring relief to those who are right across the street. So I know, I know there's some folks that are here tonight who will certainly be engaged in this mediation process, and I appreciate that. I'm looking up here, but I know that you may not wanna do it, but somebody within your community needs to be at that table. And I think um, there's gonna be a lot of, of smart people. We heard from a doctor earlier who can be part of this conversation. And um, I have great faith that uh, things will move forward and be able to happen in a meanable way. Councilor Olver. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm afraid the mayor just admitted that the uh, that letter that the developer sent out really doesn't have doesn't mean anything um, because what they said they were going to do was to pause for two months submitting more forms or more site plans and and he just said that they're in the they're early on and they're only doing submittals once a month or or less already so. A two months when you think of it's coming over Thanksgiving and Christmas you know, they might not have had anything planned to be submitted anyway so this it could be fluff but be that as, as it may um, hmm, what are we going to do are we not going to vote on uh, Councillor Springsteen's resolution and are we going to vote on my my motion sorry I'm gonna look for consensus on anything that council wants to move forward tonight Okay, um, along those lines, I've made a motion, um, and it's a weak one. I mean, it is very weak. I mean, all I say is we wish that uh, the staff not accept the fee and lieu at that development. Um, I think it gives you guys the opportunity to actually stand up for something finally, because I've been hearing uh, other counselors say, I'm listening, and we need to continue the conversation, and let's come together. And that all amounts to nothing again. So, and proclamations, <laughs> proclamations, the uh, Bear Creek Lake Park proclamation, proclamation is, was worthless. It's, this one will be exactly worthless also. I mean, we could stand up here and say, we don't want uh, you to do anything. We're gonna write it down and we're gonna read it during council meeting and the developer's gonna take it and they're going, let's see, oh, I could, I could do this or I could make $20 million. Uh, what do you think they're gonna do? <laughs> it's it's a no-brainer for them. It, it it has zero teeth, whatsoever. Um, so, 
and even my motion has zero teeth whatsoever because I'm just saying that if we pass this motion, the council wishes. Staff doesn't have to follow our wish. There's no, I mean, it'd be nice if they did. <laughs> but there's no teeth in what I'm doing, but it's at least a hint of what council is up to. And so that's what I'd like to see um, a second on that and uh, vote on that. Second. Okay, so we're gonna do this by consensus in general business. So if there's consensus and repeat the language. Sure. Uh, and also I'd like to point out that, that uh, Councillor Springsteen's point a little, few minutes ago was that we do make motions and we have made motions. Um, we just don't change ordinances with resolutions and things like that. But we do make motions and kiss the pulse. So what I said is it is city council's wish wish that staff not allow a fee in lieu arrangement for the 777 South Yarrow development. Fairly straightforward. Councilor Matt Guerrero. Um, given that it seems like neither of these resolutions would be legally binding, um, I am really interested in having a fully authored proclamation. I think that that, if others are, can get aligned, they would do the same thing. They would both essentially tell the developer where city council as a body actually is. Um, and so this to me is one specific component of this issue and it doesn't actually speak to some of the other sentiments that I think need to be t said. And then the um, resolution put forward by Councillor Springsteen seems to have a lot of uh, legal pitfalls that I would rather we didn't get into when we still have this opportunity to influence the outcome. So that's where I would be trying to drive consensus towards. Councillor Franks. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I too would be trying to drive a consensus towards the proclamation. And, and the reason is, and for those of you that have followed council for a long time, I am not a big fan of aspirational language that does not have the ability to be enforced. Um, my community, um, basically, if you go back, that we came forth and pulled out sections of the comp plan and line by line by line. We had get togethers where we literally tore the comprehensive plan apart and we organized who was going to speak about each point and we went and found other cities and what we felt was legal precedent and ultimately what we found out was the copy is in large sections was aspirational. So I've spoken from the dais before. I want to know what's legally enforceable. So I don't want to give people a false sense of something that they can't achieve. I had people reaching out to me for the last two weeks saying, do what you did for 2090. Do what you all did for Forsberg Park. And I, those don't even have even remote similarities. So I can't do those same things, but what I can do is make sure that I'm not putting out information into the community that someone will then say, well, council said that, and, there's, and if staff didn't take action, then they are violating council action. And so again, it, it's a matter of being very clear to the community about what we can and can't do. And if there's disagreement about that, then I think there are opportunities to, uh, to take those things forward. I have on several occasions in the last few months wanted to go into an executive session and there was pushback which I didn't quite understand. We don't take action in executive session, but think about this. If I'm suing my neighbor for something and I want to basically make my case and I'm consulting with my attorney, I'm doing that in private. I'm having that conversation in private because we may explore five options and they may tell me, nope, you can't do that for this reason, that way. But I don't want my opposition to know the various things I explored, which things had good merit and which things didn't. So again, I'm very focused on not putting out into the public aspirational things. I want to look at ways in which the ordinances, if we don't like how they are and we don't want to end up in this situation again, let's get in front of that. 
you can't spot zone is my understanding. Uh, we've talked about that. You have to make sure that you are able to say for this zone type or this situation, you're putting these new rules on it. You can't pick and choose those winners specifically, but you can absolutely determine if you don't want to take fee in lieu, if you want to just take that off the table. If you just want to say, nope, it must be a dedication. And if you want to say, yes, we like pocket parks. France has pocket parks, very small places for a respite to sit. When we walked around in Paris, very small parks and they're a great little sanctuary. So if our community says, no, no, we always want it to be land dedication, then we just have to know that some of those are going to be very small in nature and they're going to be expensive to maintain because again, when you don't have a large thing to maintain, you do have to add additional costs. And if the community wants to take that forward and that's something they want to invest in, um, I think that's why you heard some of us tonight wanting to uh, kind of make sure that on the, um, the mill levy, we were balancing all the things we hear from the community because some people want more investment and some people want you know, th those dollars in their pocket. And so it's always trying to represent, for my case, roughly 30,000 people as a ward person and then of course the whole city. So I apologize for taking all that time, but I think it's really important to be very, you know, explain why I'm not supporting something because in my view it, it has no legal enforceability, sends a mixed message to the public and I don't think that's a fair thing for a council to do. We have a serious job to do and uh, I, I think that uh, if this body wants to move something forward uh, into a legal review or other things, you know, those can be considered but I'm not going to put, at, you know, a wish out into the ether that then uh, can uh, mislead the public on what's possible. Thank you. So just circling back to Councillor Olvers, is there a consensus to move that forward? So there's no consensus on that. Councillor Springsteen. You know, the, the city told Councillor Franks that the school district owned 2090. That turned out not to be true. And here she is selling that same stuff to you here tonight. Let's not attack the personalities. Let's just stick with the facts, please. The other thing I want to point out is, I don't know if you caught this, but our city attorney told us that if we directed staff to do a certain thing, they would have to decide whether to do that thing or to do what they wanted. So who's in charge here? I thought we were. I thought six votes were. But apparently we've been told tonight that's clearly not the case. In any case, I, I am going to appeal the decision of the chair not to move forward with an immediate vote tonight uh, on my motion. Second. So I stated clearly that, first off, you didn't have a second on your original motion earlier, but I said that we were going through consensus. And so there is an opportunity for there to be consensus on what you're bringing forth tonight. But what I'm saying is I'm appealing your decision that it has to be consensus. I'm asking to move forward with the vote on the motion tonight. I'm appealing the decision of the chair on that issue. Okay. Which means we have to have a vote on that. Correct. I'm getting the... Right language here, one second. Okay, so my decision on the appeal is in standing practice of this body. We have um, requests for council actions that are discussed and if there's a consensus of council to move it forward, it moves forward. And that is my, um, it's my decision. And so 
um, the decision of the chair shall be sustained. So if the majority vote sustains the decision of the chair, then it will be affirmed. So again, my, my interpretation of our process is that this is a consensus <coughs> item and you're certainly welcome to seek consensus to move this forward. So if you disagree with me, vote no. If you agree, vote yes. Can we just clarify one more time what a yes vote and a no vote means on uh, this? Yes, a, a, a yes denies the appeal and a no agrees with the appeal. And passes seven I, three nays. Now what? We do the consensus vote? Yep. There's consensus to move forward with these two aspects of what was produced tonight by Councillor Springsteen. This is our consensus. Yes. So I'm not seeing any consensus. So we'll close general business and go into council reports. Ms. Hodson, do you have a, okay. Is there a ward that wants to go first? Oh, I can. Okay, ward four. Sure, um, since you guys are still here, you probably noticed this is a do nothing council. It, it's worse than you think. And by the way, I have to say, this is a marathon. This is just a setback. You're going to have to get out and vote and you know, just keep working it. Uh, you might get something somewhere. Um, but there is one thing I point out how bad this council is. Um, <laughs> this is, yeah, we have one meeting in November. And then I said, wow, how come we keep continuously having study sessions canceled? Study sessions are where we're supposed to talk of and learn about certain things. Um, we've had 10 study sessions canceled this year. Um, and we're in the 10th month. And so. <laughs> Has council learned about anything? Uh, they've learned that they can censor me. Um, and other than that, almost nothing. And I really do hope that like when the change comes and the next council comes along that they, they have a little more motivation to actually get there, learn something and, and move forward and, and do something. I mean, instead of saying, st standing here and say, well, that's a big building, maybe we should do something and then doing zero. Um, so, um, yeah, this council's horrible, but it's about to end. <laughs> Council Franks? Well, I, I won't sit idly by and uh, take that. As someone who didn't show up at the annual planning meeting until midway in, as someone who does not participate, Again, I, I'm, you're, you're speaking about how, how others do nothing. And again, I have been very quiet for very long, being disparaged for quite some time. And I just simply am not going to stand for it anymore. Um, I have worked very, very hard. Um, I will let my record stand. I show up at committee meetings. I participate. I work hard on legislation. I challenge pieces, I follow up with staff, I ask good questions. I am never going to say that I have answered and, and, and pleased everyone. This is a very difficult job. I would be remiss if I didn't say it is difficult. You have a lot of information you have to take in. You have to look at it through many lenses. You have the community who is not always unified on matters. 
Um, and uh, again, I, I just really want to just push back against that because counselor over the, when I wasn't uh, here for a meeting, chose to call me out specially for that, but never provides the information about why I did something. I'm a person who is a project manager by trade. I work on meeting efficiencies and keeping meetings focused on the task at hand. And when lines of questioning diverge into where there is nothing productive going to come out of them, your time's precious, our time's precious, and therefore I called the question. That's not something I can do by myself. Anytime we need to act, we act as a body. That's why not, not one person gets to have everything they want. You have to go out and you have to say, here's what I want to do. And you work with your fellow counselors, you work with the community, you ask questions. That's how you, you get things done up here. And to have things brought forward when the first I've heard of them is the night of, very difficult to move those things forward when there's been no conversation. So again, I, I just could not let another evening go by. I have sat idly by for a long time being accused of doing nothing, and that is emphatically not true. You even have Councillor Springsteen who misrepresents um, you know, my work. I absolutely was involved with the community that ended up intervening into a lawsuit and we were victorious. If you would like to see the result of that, I'm happy to share that. But to pick and choose pieces of information and disparage people is not fair. I never questioned Councillor Springsteen's love for her community. Long before she was on council, she came to speak up on things. She is passionate. She cares. Never question that. Rich, I never question your integrity the way you consistently question mine. And I was just unable to sit through one more attack without calling that to your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Ward 3, Councilor Springsteen. I'll go after Councillor Stewart. No, go ahead. I'll go after Councillor Stewart. I always have to go before her, so I'll go after. Councillor Springsteen, the floor is yours. Please go. Why? So she can rebut me, right? It's her last meeting. <laughs> can she not do it this time? One time can you bend the rules, sir? Lenora, it's her last meeting. please. <clears throat> so you all got to see what the leaders of this community are really about tonight. I want to thank the voters for placing their faith in me to uphold the laws of the city and the state and to represent them the past four years. It has been both a privilege and a nightmare. <laughs> If you want to know why we have three wards with only one candidate and no challenge, it's a sign of severe decay and corruption. Our system in Lakewood does not work for anybody but rich developers. It does not work for people of color. It does not work for those struggling financially. I want to thank my sweet, sweet boyfriend and my wonderful children for all they have had to go through with me these last four years. And they have suffered because I have. Um, there's been many positive things that have happened. I made many wonderful friends of constituents who are amazing activists and care about our community. I became hard as nails and resilient because I had to, especially having been disrespected by Mayor Paul at every turn. I learned how backward and corrupt our system of local government really is, so my eyes were opened. I found a passion in pursuing social justice issues, civil rights, and equality for people of color as I've seen how badly those rights are violated daily in Lakewood and Jefferson County. 
I became the vice president of legal redress for the NAACP as a result and am planning to open a chapter here in Jeffco. I made wonderful friends of those on council uh, of people who are actually mature, kind, and driven by community service rather than by ambition or other, other things. We often, uh, the people I got along with on council, we often had very, very different politics, but supported each other and were kind to each other. And thank you, Rich, Mary, Mike, Charlie, Pete, Ramey. What would I have done without at least having you? I helped a lot of people with a multitude of problems and helped them to organize, and that was a gift. It's been an arduous journey because of nefarious efforts to constantly punish and retaliate against me to get me to resign. I mean, that never ended for four years. No elected official should have to endure the type of abuse that I did to merely serve one's community in what's basically a volunteer position. Some of the things I've been through, my life was threatened more than once. My house was vandalized. It's taken me two years to put it back together. My career was threatened. My boyfriend was wrongly arrested and maliciously prosecuted and nearly killed by the Lakewood Police Department in West Metro by a forcible injection with ketamine. It was the single most traumatic event of my life. And I will never forget how 20 Lakewood police participated in that torture of somebody I love. I believe this was meant to intimidate me. Shame on all of you and everyone who failed to render accountability for that excessive use of force and attempt to intimidate and victimize a public official into resigning because that is what happened. People who were close to me or who tried to help me were threatened and retaliated against. Councillor Sherazai, I believe, maliciously put my family in danger for absolutely no reason. I feel that Adam Paul treated me with the utmost disrespect and disdain week after week, never missing an opportunity to silence me or insult me. And I believe the city manager and city attorney went along with what I think were violations of civil rights week after week. I never knew that a male could treat a female in the workplace with this kind of viciousness and abuse in the modern day or to treat one of the only people of color to ever be elected to city council with such hatred or that other women in positions of power would sit back and allow it to happen kathy allison wendy rebecca sophia jeslyn sharon bob barb shame on all of you I want to mention Charlie Abel, as he could not be here to take a bow. He served this community for so many years with such passion. He helped so many people. Thank you, Charlie. I also want to thank those of you on staff and with the police department who were professional and civil and kind, and who were not the ones always scheming against council members especially Jay and, and Missy were people that I appreciated a lot. Please continue to follow my efforts. Uh, I'm gonna put, I put together a YouTube channel, Justice Law Firm at Lady Justice Law, and I'll continue to address issues of justice, government, and law with podcasts and commentary. I already have a career as an attorney. Politics is not my career. So I look forward to going back to helping people without all the walls being put in my way all the time. I want to say that it's my opinion that this city will never have a chance of going the right direction until we have uh, new leadership on staff. 
and I was going to go into more detail on that, but that is the truth. We need changes, and we need f a breath of fresh air in this city. And I hope, I hope that that comes along, and I hope that you all get what you're looking for somewhere down the road. Because what they told you tonight is, you got nothing coming. So, thank you, all of you. Councilor Stewart. Well, I was going to have no report, but I just wanted to thank those of you on council who are transitioning off into all sorts of different things. Um, I also want to mention Councilor Abel. Um, he and I didn't always agree on a lot of things, but he um, he and I found a way to work together and, and get along, and I, I really appreciated getting to, to work with him. and. Um, you know, the the care that we had for folks in our community and the f care that he had for people in his community and his willingness to always show up and do the hard work was um, always admirable and nothing that you can find fault with uh, at the end of the day. Uh, I wanted to, oh no, I'm gonna get emotional. <laughs> I can feel it coming on. Um, thank you, Councillor Vincent, for your kindness, um, for, um, really being um, a, a mentor in how to fight for your community when it's um, the right thing to do. Um, thank you to uh, Mayor Paul um, for your leadership and your willingness to guide this uh, crazy train for the last uh, 16 years. Um, you know, you've made a really big impact on the city and that can be, um, overstated. Um, Councillor Franks, I think, was the biggest lesson that I have had in how to work together with somebody who I never thought we would ever agree on anything when I came on council and have created some policies that have passed in Lakewood that I am the most proud of, the ones that I worked on with you. Um, so thank you for that example. Um, thank you, Councillor Jansen, for your service to our community and your kindness. Uh, thank you, Councillor Springsteen, for serving our citizens in Ward 3 um, and uh, representing our people for the last um, four years. So thank all of you for your service. We're so appreciative. Great. So Ward 3, Ward 2. I thought we had to be here in a couple weeks to hand over the baton. Am I done today? Oh, I come back. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> November 13th. I was going to go. Okay. <laughs> so the 13th, we come back to technically hand over to the new crew. Yes, that's right. Okay, thank you. That's the day I'll get misty eyed for you. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'll wait. Because <laughs> I probably will too. Um, there, the, uh, there was information sent out to council about a tour of the Marisol House. This is one thing I'm really proud of Ward 2 on. Uh, Catholic Charities came and Marisol House is for women who are transitioning into permanent housing who have children. Um, so if you get a chance, um, that's a wonderful thing to do. And um, also too, I think that's it. Two meaning also, but I'm done now. <laughs> um, no report. Okay. Uh, I'm just reporting that there is not a ward meeting in November. We'll be picking that back up in um, December. And I think that's it. Councilor Jansen. Thanks. Um, I'm gonna miss Charlie. <laughs> One of the last discussions I had with him, we were talking about Texas bands, and I told him about my new friend, my new favorite Texas band, and I was I bought him a bunch of CDs, and I can't wait to give them to him. So hopefully I'll be able to get over to see him so I can play CDs for him of my new Carl's Hayes. He's my <laughs> new favorite Texas band. Anyway, um, and I. <laughs> 
I, I, I didn't vote for the, the, ta the reduction because it just doesn't, it goes against, I mean, everybody's always talking about, you know, follow the charter, follow the charter, you know, follow the constitution. And that's always been my heart is that we have a constitution, we must follow the rules. And it seems like we always break the rules when you want something done. So um, I felt I'm gonna keep my, my, the way I feel about my integrity, about following the constitution and following the rules. And um, I mean, this is my last meeting and I'm glad, thank you. Um, I had fun, I did learn a lot. Um, thank you, Rich, for fun times of <laughs> discussing things <laughs> and some of your dog bowls and that's what I'll always remember. Uh, thank you Sophia for your eloquence and your great hairstyle. Um, thank you Rebecca. <laughs> thank you Rebecca uh, for your smile and Barb for your, um, your, your great intelligence and Wendy for your warm hearts. Uh, thank you Adam for um, helping me out for some things. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you Jeslyn. Um, I appreciate you and when I poured water all over my laptop and I couldn't get it to work. Um, thank you, Anita. Th Anita, it's, it's been a wild ride. And thank you, Sharon. I, I really appreciate all the, all the work you've done. And, and thank you, everybody, um, for staff. I really appreciate staff. Um, I've always asked questions and I've always got most of my answers back. There's, there's a few I still haven't gotten answered. <laughs> I don't know if I still have another week. <laughs> I'll resubmit them. Um, and thank you community for showing up and showing that you care because um, there are some people on this council who really do care about about things and I um, you know I'm just really sad that things can't go the way that we always want them to um, life is just not fair um, but we do you can make a difference and don't give up that's all I'm gonna say you know I I was never expected to win the seat. I really didn't think I ever would. I'm just a regular person. I didn't go through any kind of politic school. <laughs> I just kind of jumped in and, and, and hoped for good things. And, and I still hope for good things. Um, and I guess that's all I have. I'm gonna give it over to Mayor Pro Tem. Thanks. Thank you, and thank you, Mary, for your partnership over the next, uh, the last, the next couple of years, the last couple of years you've done. <laughs> I um, likewise try not to get sentimental, but it is, um, it's really been a pleasure to work with you, Sharon and Barbie. You guys have been amazing. I've learned so much from you, your mentorship, and being able to um, provide so much context and. Um, Likewise, we landing on things that we may have not have started out agreeing on, but being able to come to the table and have constructive conversations has been really powerful. And, and thank you for being um, part of the initial journey that we've had here um, within City Council. And you know, for all of you that are getting ready to step off, Mayor Paul, for your leadership over the last, not two years, but a long time. <laughs> and um, on that note, I will say that in Ward 5, we are having a ward meeting coming up. It'll be Saturday, November 4th, and in a slightly different format than we're used to. We're having it as an open house, and I really wanted it to be an, op an opportunity for the community to come by and um, thank you, Councillor Jansen for her um, service over the last couple of years as it'll be her last ward meeting. And um, I have also, we do have a number of community volunteer members that will be showing up as well. So excited to introduce everybody. Location TBD, we're trying to find a coffee shop type of a venue. So stay tuned on that. We'll send out updates when we have them. And that's all I've got. I guess I'm last. All right, well, I'll just be brief and thank the community for a long time, uh, six years on the water board, eight years on city council, and eight years as your mayor. It's been an incredible journey. I think I kind of had to say everything I could in my farewell letter, but um, I do know that good prevails, not always in our time frame, and there's certainly not a book on how to be mayor, and so there's been a lot of growing that I've had to do in many different ways 
And so I thank uh, many who've cared about me and have been patient with me and uh, in some ways along the way that I've um, made their life harder. So I appreciate um, all of that support and love and understanding. And um, we have a great city, right? And support your next mayor because it's not always easy as evidenced by tonight. These aren't easy decisions. And, you know, to be out there and, and one thing you can't doubt is the love for this community and the love that this community has for for who it is and what it wants to be. So um, we're super fortunate. We have an incredible staff. And, you know, us electeds come and go. Staff staff is here and they are the, the they're, um, they're the true dedicated public servants who do care and put in day in, day out, stay here till 105 in the morning, um, take arrows and all that sort of stuff. So we're very fortunate, very blessed to have a top-notch team and I hope your team knows that and I hope they know that we really do appreciate them. And to a person when you're out in the community, you know, we have these issues. Most people love this city and they understand how important um, you are and our Lakewood Police Department. We have two agents with us tonight and uh, so proud of our Lakewood Police Department and it's always been a bright spot for me to to be able to have that and all of that put together. So incredible residents and you know it's been a fun group to serve with. Uh, Councilor Oliver actually you know he supported me once so there's that and so I appreciate your service to the community. Um, Councilors Maya Guerrero, Stewart and uh, Strom and Sherazai when you got elected I was like oh my goodness things are going to be pushed in, in a way that's going to make me feel uncomfortable but through that uncomfortableness came growth and an ability to really understand. I think you've been such a bright spot for this city and have really reshaped and you're the next generation of leadership. So I'm truly grateful for you. Councilor Franks and I, believe it or not, started out on opposite sides. She's a tough one and um, she's done a lot for this city. And going all the way back from, you know, we were at, at odds about land use about processes and she has put in, showed up, done so much research. She is so analytical. And so you know when she does say something or she is advocating, she's done her homework and you better have done your homework or you're gonna get crushed. And I think her lasting legacy, she talked about preserving parkland, but for a long time, for years, since our inception, the city of Lakewood had a, a city attorney program that was really uh, quarterbacked from a firm that we hired and we were one of the only cities of our size that continued to have that sort of format and she she bravely stood up and said I think we need something different and that was a tough change right for a lot of folks and for people that really you know had been here a long time so thank you for that I think it's paid dividends as we've seen in our attorney reviews and and what's happened so thank you Councillor Franks Mary, when she says she really does care about the Constitution, she really does care about the Constitution. And so I appreciate that and um, appreciate you always willing to do what you felt was right and, and had your heart in it. Um, Councillor Springsteen, thank you for your four years of service. Councillor Vincent, you go a long way back. But going back to the early days of RTD when she, and even down to the finite discussions of should we build sound walls or should we have no, no sound walls, right? And those tough things about how that divides a neighborhood. And then also a neighborhood that has endured the most development, the most change, and probably the least amount of infrastructure. And um, you've always been fun and, and said things that were inappropriate and served as mayor pro tem, which was pretty fun too. So I know you're ready to, to ride off and I'm surprised you want to come back on the 13th. <laughs> And, and last but certainly not least, Councillor Abel, who um, I'll never question his love for our community. And we certainly were able to go at, able to go at each other like that. And, but I never doubted where he was coming from. And he did serve as mayor pro tem for this city. And he gave a lot of time and energy. And um, his background was that of a reporter. So he really sought to find what the facts were and to really dig into it. So I want to thank him for his dedication and service to our community. And with that, we're gonna shut her down at 110. Thank you.